What's up, everybody? Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Bridge the Gap. We are so excited to be back again on this Saturday here. Shout out end of the week for helping us make this all freaking real. Shout out to co-host Flacco Bayo, who I don't you don't see, but he's there. He's gonna talk for sure. And most importantly, shout out our guest tonight, Breeze Eva Flowing. My name is Holden Stefan Roy. And uh, basically what we do here at Bridge the Gap, I'll explain the concept, is uh, we have people like you who are knowledgeable and know a lot of things because you've lived a lot of life and are able to share such knowledge nuggets with us, the peoples. And then you have me who knows a lot less things and is sincerely curious. And effectively what we do is we walk through your life story and we learn a bunch of stuff. And then I'll learn something talking to the cats from New York City. Y'all do this thing in the middle of your sentences where you go, nah, I mean, right? And that's a real thing that a lot of people do. But here's the thing, yo. I don't know yeah. what y'all mean in most cases because I'm from Montreal, Quebec, and I never even been to New York City one time. So what we do is we walk through your story, and in a sense, we're kind of like explaining to the rest of the world. Like we got this lady from Norway who watches this stuff and all sorts of things. So as we go through your life, we get to also explain a lot of little hidden gems of hip hop and stuff, culturally speaking, from back in the day times to the today times that most of us just can't know because we're not actually there. So with that, it really is a pleasure to have you here with us. I heard some stuff from back in the day. I heard some stuff from you from today. You are a sincerely talented MC with a crazy, crazy catalog of interesting stuff out there. So with that... Thank you for being here with us today. And if it's all right with you, I can ask you my token first question that I like to start this off with. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So it's a bit of a story and you'll just, it'll all make sense at the end. So my girlfriend is uh, washing the dishes and uh, she's listening to that black eyed piece on the, I got a feeling and whatever. She's dancing around and she's washing the dishes. And this is kind of recent, right? And I'm like, yo, that's something like, she's doing chores. And I'm like thinking, yo, I remember when we were in the club and everybody was dancing around in circles. We were all turned up, drunk as fuck, 2 a.m., listening to the, I gotta feel, you know, same track. But now it's chores music, which made me have this realization that all this stuff that people are turning up to today, all this fun music, it's just, it's just going to become chores music one day or exercise music or pick a different vibe for the music as time goes on. The era and place of how the music fits into people's life changes with them because you still love that shit. But that with that got me thinking about my youth a little bit. And it made me realize that when it comes to like a musical journey, you don't really like start with like your preferences. It's not like when you're a teenager or 12. It's not a stretch in Bobito. It's none of that stuff. It's like earlier, earlier. Like for me, it's like being five and my mom is listening to shitty disco tapes that she found at the garage thing where they did the bad versions of disco songs or, or like, you know, a bunch of other stuff like that. And my dad had tapes and it was always tapes, right? Of Zeppelin or we would have the radio playing crappy techno. I mean, to me, it was crappy at the time. Now I kind of fuck with it. But like techno at two in the morning on the night radios and stuff. So it was all these vibes and stuff in the car. I remember Chris DeBerg. That was a big one. And so all these different things. But it, that's the stuff that honestly I was forced to listen to. And if I think about my musical journey, that's the stuff where it really starts. So my curiosity is for you, Mr. Breeze Ever Flowing. What is the sounds of like your super youth before you had control over the sounds in your life? What were you listening to as a young one? Um, wow. Yeah, and that's the first time I've ever been asked that. Thank in, you. In, yeah, <laughs> quite a few interviews. Yeah. Um, and, and and as you were talking and, and as you brought up the memories of your mom, like I, I started like getting back and, you know, um, I'm thinking about the, the seventh floor apartment on uh, Broadway and 101st Street is uh, where I grew up. My mom was a Brazilian. She was a single mother um, raising me and my sister. She um, would always put on samba records every day, all day. Um, and so the house would always be jumping with samba music playing in the background. Um, and then as my sister, who was four years older than me, like she laid the groundwork 
by introducing me to disco. Like I grew up in the 70s. I was born uh, December 18th, 1970. And um, so throughout the 70s, as I got older, my, my older sister would buy records. And we had this, <laughs> this all in one cabinet and old, older people would remember these things because the TV was in the middle and you would open it with like a little screen. <laughs> okay, flock or not. <laughs> I know what that is too, though. I can picture it. Yes, yes, that thing. Um, so if you've ever seen it before, the TV's in the middle and it's this big tube TV, right? And then on top would be a record player and there'd be another like reveal drawer. Like furniture back in the days was no joke. Like it was all purpose. Um, so there was a record player inside of it and then in there, right next to it, we'd have the stack of records. Um, and so my sister would have the disco records and my mom would be rocking the samba. And then I, I bought the hip hop into the house as a little boy. And that was me listening to the uh, the radio late at night, um, once, twice a week, eventually. And um, I, would, I had a, a tape recorder, one of those big clunky tape recorders. And I would push it up against the speaker and have the volume like just loud enough for it to pick up the hip hop shows that were playing back in the days. Um, and then I would rock out to those tapes starting at like the age of nine. Um, and so that's 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 how it all started for me. So, yo, that's 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 an amazing answer, because, yo, for us, it's like unfathomable, honestly, in a way. Right. Like I have a version of sitting there with bad tech doing that, but like. First of all, we're talking about the seventies. Like we're talking about fresh disco records, right? Like, what's it like? Wh what part of New York are you from? I know you said street um, names, but that meant nothing to me when you said it before. <laughs> no worries, <laughs> yo. My bad. I, 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 yeah, and you're right. This is this is global. So, um, uh, Broadway and 101st is in Manhattan, and that okay. was um, you know, Broadway is Broadway. Broadway runs from Washington Heights all the way down. Um, uh, like the real, the, the Broadway, Broadway, the Broadway, Broadway. Um, and so I was up on the higher end of Broadway on 101st and that was the upper West side of, uh, Manhattan. Um, Boom. Yeah, Boom. This is a beautiful well, thing. This is a conversation that I have with my friends all the time. You live on the cusp, right? A hundred street to like 110 is that. Is it like I have these this argument with my other New Yorker friends, right? And all, I feel like only uptown people or people who pay attention to the map really understand, which is yeah. like those 10 blocks, they still consider it sometimes Spanish Harlem or Harlem, depending mm -hmm. on what side of the of you know the park you're on. Um and the and I'm just like, no, that's upper west side. If you look on yeah. the map. That's the name of the neighborhood. Harlem finishes at 110th Street. So everything under there is Upper West Side, which is like a pretty affluential neighborhood now, right? Yeah, it is. Oh, yeah, we got bought out a long time ago. Like mm. back in the 80s, we got bought out of that neighborhood because we had moved from there to 102nd and Central Park. And even over there, it was still on the border because we was right up the block from Douglas Projects. And back in those days, like when, you know, I mean, crack era, like you would hear machine gun fire down the block. Like it, that's how it was living on Central Park West. Wow. And so now that's unheard of. Like you can't go anywhere near the park. Anywhere yeah, no, anywhere. now that's unheard of. Yeah. Now that's yeah. like what I'm literally going to tell Holden, like, yo, when he comes, because he's coming to New York and I'm going to tour guide him. Right. And I'm just yeah. like, that's totally an area that I'd take him to. And and he he he's hearing what you're saying now. And he's probably like, "Hey, don't take me to where the no, the machine guns no, are clapping." No, 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 for real. Like I'm sitting there going, yeah, "You're not gonna." It's, but gentrification it's nothing like did that. happen, right? Yeah, no, it's <laughs> nothing like that. It's incredibly beautiful. It's a beautiful neighborhood yeah, I know, now. I know, it, but like that, also, he said he was the year he was born, and I do have a decent understanding of a little bit of the history mm -hmm. of the era and how certain things were a lot more different then than they are now. Plus, I wouldn't go fucking anywhere without somebody from the city holding my hand. I'm not going to be real with you. Like, that's just the kind of person I am. I want to go to a place like New York City and have people from New York City show me New York City. I don't want to go to New York City and Google. Yeah. 
that's me. Also, my girlfriend compliments your use of the reusable water bottle because that's really cool. Sometimes people use plastic water bottles. Sometimes they use reusable ones, and that's really dope of you. Man, I'm just trying to stay conscious of it. You know, I had a lot of time to uh, just sit down and think, right, as we all have. Um, so definitely try to be uh, more conscious of the intake and just hydrate more. So I got to try to keep this near me as much as possible. That's really cool, though. I like that. That's health shit. Um, no, it's important. I know I say it like it that, is, but it's like real important stuff. Yeah. Oh, Helps dude, for the earth me. too, yo. Like there's just little things yeah. that we can do, you know? And something like that is definitely one of those things. Um, uh, uh, you know, changing your, not using those um, soaps with the little beads in them. These are just little things that it's just yeah. a, a simple adjustment that if it can help the environment even a little bit, it's a worthwhile like thing to do, you know. Facts. So I'm with Greece. Um. Yeah. All right, so let's go back to your youth, though, because I mean, for you, it might not be like interesting to sit there and think about what it's like to be seven in these times. For me, it's super interesting to think about what it's like for you to be seven in these times. Let's say, like, cause yo, what, like, are you like in a place where there's all these parties and stuff happening all around you? Like, I don't know anything about the Upper East Side in the seventies. Like, you can, it, like, it's yeah, so cool. It, it, it's more the cultural thing, right? Like I, I, I was always around parties because you know my mom, you know, was part of the Brazilian scene in in, in New York, and you know they, it was always all about the house parties. People would get together at different houses. We would host parties at our house. I remember when I got a little older, I would try to sneak some uh, cachaça from my mom's cabinet um, just so I can, uh, you know, feel feel a little burn. Um, so. <laughs> There was always a party, and I remember that there was the kids' room at the party, and so all the adults would be in the other room. We'd be in that kids' room, um, and uh, you know we just fall in the sleeping cabs on the way home. So, you know, mom definitely had a good time, and uh, it's crazy too. And I think about those days, like all the all the secondhand smoke in the house. Like nobody thought about any of that stuff. Like there was ashtrays on the on the buses. Um, <laughs> it was it was loose um and uh probably led to some of my bad habits later on but you know that, that's all part of the story right no but that's actually an important part of the story right you get yeah, exposed man. to something in an environment it develops into a bad habit maybe today people might question rules and why things exist right so as yeah. knowledge nuggets to understand and to acknowledge that it had an impact on you like that's mad self-aware I, I commend that. I don't think like any part of anyone's story is bad. You're an incredible person. I heard all of the music you dropped this year. There's not a single bar that you put out that was not wisdom filled or proactive or for your community and all these things. So if along the way there might be bad habits, that's just part of the humanization of you as you get to this amazing place in life that you're at today. Appreciate that, man. It's the truth, though. That's why it's, like, always good to talk about the honestest stuff proper, you know? Absolutely. But like, I, I want to hear more about this um, this growing up with, with, with the... Because I, I, I was unaware that you were Brazilian. And that's super interesting to me because I, like, my, my mother is Nicaraguan. My father's Puerto Rican. And mm -hmm. they grew up... Like, I grew up hearing a lot of bomba in my house. And I didn't realize until recently getting a little bit more in touch with my like what my parents would play like right growing up i would always have like this very like i don't want to listen to what my parents listen to you know like and especially growing up in the 80s having like yeah. hip-hop be around and so ubiquitous yes. back then right yes. i was very anti everything latin and my parents culture and their music because I was so entrenched in Bronx and New York City culture, right? Mm -hmm. And hip hop culture. Um, yeah. But like, as I've recently gotten into, like I'm coming to realize that, wow, I did not realize, like my parents had my sisters in um, in Bomba dance troupes. And so yeah. like, uh, if I'm not mistaken, right? I, I, if I'm not mistaken, I believe Samba, like Bomba has its um, roots uh, indigenous roots based in Africa, right? Musically? Yes, absolutely. Can you expand on yeah. that a bit more? Because honestly, I'm sitting here going, what the fuck's a bomba? Um, I don't mean it disrespectfully. I just swear I've never no, heard no, it no, before no, in my life. No, no, no. That's what we're here for. That's, that's exactly totally, totally. what that... Yeah. 
it's it's the way that the the instruments uh, were made and and the way that they were put together. These were the slave instruments, um, like things like the beating bow and 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 those type of things. That the way that the drums were stretched out, like, um, and then they just adopted it and, and infused some of the, the the Latin culture into it. Um, but it, it's 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 all built off of those African rhythms. Mm. Yeah, and it's like hypnotic. Like it's, it's some of the most hypnotic music ever. You might not even like it, but if it comes on, um, you you, you or maybe you change that, right? You might not seek it out, but if it comes on, you probably like it. Mm. It's just got this 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 kind of pull and gravity to it. it it's 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 amazing. And 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 as you were speaking, right? Like I, I was I was forming the words to say the same thing because that was the impact of hip hop culture it was a culture it was already packed it was put together it was it was bubbling it was forming um it, it was it was active and in seeking involvement like wanting people to get into it and, and and push it um and when you're young and impressionable like for real like i, I was like this is it um and, and same feeling I just dove in and then I, and then i went on a completely different path with my sister really embrace the Brazilian culture and you know she she's way more fluent than I am um she's she's been way more than I have um and and she's just connected to the to that side of the family in the ways that I am not um because I I, I embraced this other culture that was emerging at the time and, and and make no mistake it was a culture you know there were there were rules to that society like um, and uh, so, so know, if I understand, a, a lot of that currency was was the respect. Yeah, like was it like weird then to be part of multiple cultures? So you had to like almost pick one and ingratiate into it. You couldn't like hop around. I'm, I'm not, I don't know if I'm framing that right, but no, you are. Because at first it was awkward, right? Because you know, I, I, mom, I, my mom used to make me samba in front of people when they would come over, like when I was a little kid, like. I remember like being like seven or eight and you know my mom throwing on the, the samba record and saying you know pulling me out and I, I i get my feet moving i was killing it too i was <laughs> um but then around 13 you know i'm that kid it's 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 82 83 um it, the, the hip-hop is there and in the, the undertone it's, it's everywhere we walk around i'm seeing it in the street i'm seeing the trains painted like it was amazing. It was magical to me. You so know? you were like, and it was calling me. Yeah. I just want to like make sure everybody understands what he's literally saying here. So like, let's say, when does hip hop to you start? Like, when does it start? Start. Um, um for me, seventy nine. For me, like as a nine year old, starting to expand a little bit more, and, and the other kids at school who are you know talking about things. You know, somebody's older brother put somebody on and, and it took a while to get to us. I mean, for the older kids, I mean, they were probably, you know, getting it back in 77, 78 as it was just starting to, to form up. So what's the first hip hop song that you can remember being like, yeah, that's that. That's that shit. Um, it was like a uh, 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 the first like one of the first big crossover uh, collabo songs that kind of stuck in my head. Um, this would be like the, the, a pre-scenario kind of scenario. It was, um, I think it was the Force MDs versus the Fat Boys on the Staten Island Ferry. I think that was the, the song was actually, that was the premise of it. So they were, they were battling on the Staten Island Ferry. Nice. That's crazy. And um, I think you know, that sounds and, and, familiar. Like I don't know why some like like I feel like I've literally seen that as the track name somewhere before. I, I, I I'm gonna have to search it out. Um, and, and if somebody's doing it, googling now, it, it, it maybe it's a different set of artists, but it, it, it's a battle on the Staten Island Ferry. Foursome D's was involved in it. I know it's Foursome D's. I think it's the Fat Boys, but. It, it, it's that kind of song right where you're just like what that even happened like yes that was happening and that's when you started seeing these different um groups that, are, that were finding success individually like doing these like crossovers and collabs and and that's where the connections are starting to happen 
Um, and um, it, it became really interesting. And then right after that came the, the you know, the crews, you know, and then the first crew that really had an impact on me was the Juice Crew. Um, I was like, Molly Mall's in control was like my, my high school jam. I remember I I had invested in a in a double cassette Walkman that I bought from one of those Japanese import shops that used to be on 72nd Street, and uh, I spent my whole after school money on that one. But um, it was worth it until it got jacked from me in some class or somebody got it out of my my drawer. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> but understand I would dub exactly Molly what that control like. for other people. <laughs> yeah. Yo, honestly, this is amazing stuff, my guy. No, this is perfect. You don't understand. Normally, I have to try to trick people into doing what you're just magically doing. This is it. You're doing the show (laughs) properly. This is, uh, we want knowledge nuggets. Yo, for me, it's mad helpful. Like, even like the two months or whatever we've been doing this, my my understanding of the foundational elements of what made hip hop special, why New York like is the is the mecca. I will say, like, I understood it. It was cool. I understood a lot, but as far as Wikipedia goes, right? Like as far as you can watch a documentary or something, right? Or or whatever. And that goes so far. But to hear you just describe being there at that time, literally living those moments, having things happen that other people rap about and stuff. Like you got to understand this is really important, I think, for everybody that's not from New York to hear you describe this stuff because yo how many i started i did this thing with a 17 year old the same kind of thing i was talking to a 17 year old and they didn't even know how the fuck i grew up they i was like the old guy in this conversation like proper old guy i'm like i'm like yeah there wasn't computers in my house growing up and he's like right like he couldn't handle that so that's why it's called bridge the gap Cause yo, if me yeah. listening to your like, it's not okay. Like, I have a good idea at this point of a little bit what it's like, but every time I hear more, it just paints the picture. And everyone in the audience, like, yo, when I asked about the samba thing before bamba or whatever, another guy was like, I want to know more too. Why? Because we don't know this stuff. People don't talk about it. You can't even Google half this shit. <laughs> so anytime you want, and to even if, and even and the truth is, and the truth is, even if you could Google it, right? you're not gonna you're not gonna get the full breath of you know like sometimes you can read a sentence and depending on what's on your mind it mm-hmm. doesn't even register you know mm-hmm. and then you read it at another time when you're incredibly vulnerable emotionally and, and you don't even realize it and you're reading something in depthly not even realizing that you're giving it this much attention and then you read something in it and it just touches you and it's something that you've read before. But it's because that reading sometimes mm-hmm. doesn't do you the same service nah. as hearing something like, from yo, somebody But it's mouth. not even just hearing it. Do you not see the smile on his face as he's describing this? The pure bliss yeah. of thinking about the foundation <laughs> of this. And yo, like that, yeah. you can't just get that. So you get as long-winded, whatever. You can be as breezy and ever-flowing as you need to be-zy up on this exactly. stream Z. <laughs> No doubt. That's what's up. All right. So let's say you're like 12, 13. You're surrounded by hip hop. You've already indicated that you're paying attention to the graffiti arts. You've already indicated that you were a dancer. Um, so you're already ingratiated in, in at least three of these elements. Are you already into lyrics and rapping at this age? Is this already something you're interested in? Are you interested in the D- DJ side of things? I, I idolize the MCs that's what happened because i that's when i was coming of age like so when i was you know uh 15 um that's the 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 jump off of the of the lyricist right the the lyricist taking taking prominence before it was the the dj was still headlining like it was it was just jumping off the you know uh, you know dj jazzy jeff and fresh prince but you know the dj was the headliner in most of those scenarios right and um and, and rightfully so, at, at the time, it was the DJ that, you know, really got things off the ground and, and made people pay attention to the level that brought it to where it is now, right? Um, but the MC took took the prominence. And so as a 15-year-old, seeing like super confident, super suave, Rakim, uh, Big Daddy Kane, um, super smart, 
uh, KRS One, you know, providing me with the, with the, just a different perspective lyrically to pull me into, you know, exploring more and, and, and digging more into, you know, the real history of things. Um, it, it had a, a tremendous impact. Like that was it. So then I, I became a, a fan of lyricism, but I still wasn't like writing seriously until you know I was like uh, seventeen or eighteen. And at that point in time, uh, you know, we would play football games in, in Central Park and um, and uh, I would write recap rhymes of the game and I would just kick it to one or two homies afterwards. And, um, you know, both of them were starting to be like, yo, you, you're getting kind of good at this. Like, you might want to want to think about it. And then at some point... Um, Hold up. One of them you were you were me. you were like rapping out. Was it like freestyles, or were you writing? But like recaps of the no, game. I, I was writing recaps of the of the of the of the football games he was having on the. Do weekend. you have like a sample of what that would be like? Can you kick a little recap oh, rhyme? Dude, I man, I have no idea. Like I wish I still had some of that stuff. You know, that's uh, fair. There, there's you know in in between and, and during the rough times like you know there there was an eviction that happened where i lost a lot of uh really important stuff and uh all those all those old books all those old memories like gone but uh you know it, it's it's a uh, it was definitely one of those learns in in life that uh you don't want to repeat and uh but man that those those rhymes man like uh I, I wasn't even thinking about it. I wasn't even thinking seriously like, like at all about being an MC. I was just having fun making lyrical recaps of these games. And I think that's when it was like the the what I had been intaking for so long was finally starting to seep in. And of course, like the the rhymes, I can tell you this, they were probably patterned after Big Daddy King because I, I would I would steal his his uh his rhyme pattern. Hey, yo, here's here's a, here, actually I kicked this verse on one of these releases this week this this year it was a, I remember back in high school with the fellas writing rhymes for my man Sean and Kevin Ellis and they would tell this little wannabe star he's on to something with it breeze form then I come to live it I used to listen to Kane his flow I bit it the way he leaned on the first two hold on the third then on the fourth he hit it of course he did it on another level. I'll never compare, never be there. Just like there'll never be another breeze ever nowhere. And there'll never be another you. That's if you keeping it true. Um, so that was the the verse. That was dope. Oh, that was mad. Peace. That's dope. Those those are those are t- those are the type of lyrics that, you know, personally speaking, I always that's the shit that made me gravitate. So I mean, you know, MCs are we're always all preaching you know self be yourself type thing yeah. but you're putting it into words that i don't think i've ever heard put in that way you know yeah. that was really dope my guy that was amazing you somehow compared yourself to a legend while not doing it in a way that will piss anyone else while also making your listener be part of the legendary status that is actually kind of legendary <laughs> Uh, Big Zeus says you're a great illustrator and you also love comics. Did that also start when you're young? Thank you, Big Zoo. You're always very helpful. <clears throat> it did. It did. <laughs> I got um, um, I uh, I got bit by the comic bug in 1980. Woo. Um, I, I went to um, PS9 on 84th Street and Columbus Avenue. That's still Upper West Side, but that's like more the swanky part. But the public school was still there. In fact, uh, my mom, I think, may have um, exaggerated some things for us to go to school down there, um, and not where we where we live, um, so so we can enjoy something a little bit different. But it was a, it was a crazy mixed school, and every lunch break, I would go out with this dude Robert Lee and and uh, Anthony B, and uh, Anthony was like, you know, Eastern European, and Robert Lee um was uh asian american and uh you know that was my squad and we go to west side comics um and then robert started boosting from west side comics and he would come with the bubble and me and amp would work the two sides of the bins and then robert would just grab clumps of back issues and just throw them in his coat 
And then we would all just peace out like nothing was happening. Um, and so we would hit up West Side Comics on a regular um, while, while we were on that little spree. And, um, you know, eventually we just got shook because then we just kind of felt them, that eyes burning when we start walking in there. Like they, they, they the paranoia of successful crimes. <laughs> <laughs> paranoia that comes with successful crimes. Let me tell you something. You create a, you, you get enough, you get away with a crime enough times, just natural paranoia just starts coming Dude, about you. You're just that's like, facts, wow. man. I had to run shoplifting chocolate bars from the grocery store when I was a teenager. And yo, you just knew it. Like after a while, you're like, yo, there's some law of averages shit or something that's about to like kick in here and it's going to fuck me up. And then one day you like feel it. It might not happen to you, but then you might feel that hand on your shoulder. And you're like, yeah, fuck, yeah, dude, <laughs> yeah. We were shook. We were so shook. <laughs> but we're like ten and eleven, and that's that's a part of New York that, like, you know, like you start with the with the corner store, and that's your first place. And and if they're sleeping over there, it opens the door. And I think every kid goes through a little boosting spree. In, in the city, it just is some some continue and make a career out of it, right? Like, <laughs> I definitely, I definitely, I, I definitely uh, uh, went through a boosting stage. I was boosting toy cars at the McCrory's yes. in the Bronx on Allerton Avenue, and I got caught. And the dude, um, uh, the dude that caught me, there was another kid from my school there. And my father was the superintendent of the building, and it was a senior citizen building, right? And so everybody at my school thought that I was a rich kid on the low, and then my dad owned the building, right? So there was a yeah. kid in the in the fucking place when I got caught robbing that snitched on me and told them where I lived, and dude took me to my door and like brought me to my mom, and my the the snitch kid pointed me all the way out. To, trash but yo all new york city kids go through a boost in faith nah, i'm gonna say Reason, that, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say that that might also be a montreal thing because i know a lot of us a lot of us out there chatted out a little bit yo it's i mean we got a million people here like you got a lot of corner stores where you can get away with a thing and then then you get to that to the grocery store and you realize a hoodie with the pocket out right you, you just walk in with your hands pushed out like that, right? And you realize, yo, I can put a oh, couple yeah. little things in there. And then, yo, mm. I mean, I went to the video store. Everybody, like, stole shit from there, too. Like, people just really like to steal. I mean, when you're young, it's it's adventure. Because, yo, there's that adrenaline rush, right? There's that. Oh, yeah. Oh. And everything feels like a victimless crime when you're young. Like, oh, it's a company. It's a store. It's like, whatever, whatever. It's not like whatever, you know? Man. Getting back but, to school and divvying up them comics felt like the biggest reward ever. But then that got me into um, X Men, and he had, he had gotten some back issues. And it was the Chris Claremont, John Byrne run on X Men. So if you're a deep comic head, this is an iconic run for comics. Period. Um, I am and, a big um, comic head, and I'm really man, gonna enjoy this part. Yeah. So he, that that those comics sucked me in before i was like kind of interested but that line at the age of 10 um and so then i started buying more of the back issues into their run and it was right around the transition when uh, dave cochran was coming back to the book um and um that was still really really good i i i i was enjoying the dave cochran return um that was when um you know they had the whole, whole um shire thing and the and the um the Star Jammers were introduced. Um, uh, Colossus got killed the first of a dozen times. Like um, it was, it was some good stuff. So I was sucked in, and and then I, I I've been drawing since I was four years old. So outside oh, of music, like, how'd that start? I just would scribble and draw on everything. I've drawn every single book that I had. All my um, my storybooks had like drawings inside of them. Um, you know anything that I could draw on? Literally, I would draw on. Um, that's that's just you know how it was coming out of me, and I was always the kid doodling in the notebook in school, and on everything, every single page, not just a random doodle here and there. Like every margin on every single page in every class had drawings inside of it, but I was able to keep up 
I, I wasn't killing it because I wasn't really invested, so I didn't really apply myself. Um, but I was easily able to do the the test and stuff because I was reading the the John Byrne Fantastic Fours through high school, and I don't know what kind of research he was doing, but man, he was digging into some uh, deep cosmic science around that time, and the verbiage that he would have Reed Richards leveraging throughout those pages was like some next level stuff so i had to become smarter to keep up with reading those comic books but i wasn't reading nothing else but top percentile for like reading so so with art and with the uh hold, hold, hold on a second because yeah that's yeah. big what you just said <clears throat> the comic books was mad smart with the language use so it forced you as a youth maybe you didn't care about stuff in a more formal way but it forced you to up your knowledge game to keep up with the comics. Now, personally, I'm interested in alternate education because I think a lot of the times people have trouble with school. It's because it's kind of boring. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, maybe using comic books, you can teach science. Like, just Absolutely. that's the first thing that popped into my head when he said that. Like, yo, if I could read a graphic novel that broke down photosynthesis and other such things, um, that would be kind of cool. I mean, you can make it like really cool with plants sucking up sun and. I, sh I shit. can echo. I can echo his sentiments. I learned. I learned when my parents used to put me on punishment and take away my comic books and my baseball cards and the things that mattered to me as a kid. Right, mm -hmm. my father would make me read the Encyclopedia Britannica. Like that was yes. part of my punishment. Like you got to read this. We bought this. You're going to read it. We bought this for your education. You're going to read this. And what I would then do is look up all the things that mattered to me from comics. So now I'm looking up Cyclops. I'm looking up and I'm learning about about uh, Greek mythology, right? And and yeah. um, and uh, uh, Greek mythology, even um, Norse mythology with Thor, Ooh, and and shit. like look, yes. learning yes. what a Wolverine, learning what animals yes. were because. What's a Wolverine exactly? Like what? What? What's a Wolverine? Like, I this is a cool word, uh, uh, and then uh, just words. Period. Like he was saying, p uh, posthumous, posthumous. Uh, I don't. Yep. I still to this day don't know how to I pronounce it correctly because I've always just read it in comics. <laughs> so there was no audio telling me this is how you pronounce this word. It's now that I've watched enough videos where I hear people say posthumous. But I'm like, okay, so I guess it's posthumous. It posthumous? But to me, Is I'm that like, how it's, it's pronounced? posthumous. Isn't it posthumous? I I've it's... heard a lot of people. I, I, I can't wait. I've heard a lot of educated cause... people call, say, uh, say posthumous. That's so weird. I always thought it was posthumous. I thought it was posthumous. Yo, y'all can weigh in in the comments wherever. I don't really fucking know, to be but honest. To, to echo, just to echo what Breeze is saying, as a fellow grow up in New York City, um, uh, uh, um, uh, around all this culture right and then mm -hmm. to also be entrenched in comic books because it challenges you in ways mm -hmm. that like mm -hmm. maybe the school system isn't is like that's i totally could relate to that i totally can can relate absolutely yo believe it or not the Dude, comment went both directions encyclop... with that <laughs> but but the encyclopedia britannica part right like looking up those characters, like I'm picturing like the way they had the images on the page and then the descriptions underneath it, like, and Encyclopedia Britannica was a big investment for parents back then. Like it was, it was big. Like, you know, if you had then they were the, that was, they were, that was different than the world book. It wasn't a world book. Britannica was like the next level. That's like nowadays investing in a decent computer for your kids. Mm. I have seen the books, but I've not had the books, but uh, I can appreciate how cool it would be to like be able to do that and to be able to get that knowledge on and to be able to like have the comic books incentivized. This is a cool chat. Like this is really like what I like getting into is because, you know, context too. like I sit there and go, you know, my whole like education with Google this like Google came out in 98. Right. And I start high school in 2000. So you just got to understand, like, the whole thing for me was always how to internet. Um, yeah. Yo, I have a question from the comments, and you might be extra qualified to answer it in light of our comic book chat. 
It's from my dude, Nuclear Convoy. He goes, so it sounds like y'all were Marvel fans, not DC. How important is it that these stories were based out of NYC 2? No, DC was definitely in there um, because the the second comic that grabbed me was uh, the New Teen Titans by uh, Wolfman and Perez. Mm. And, And that was another one of those super iconic runs leading up to one of my favorite comic books of all time, which was X-Men Teen Titans, drawn by Walt Simonson, my favorite artist when it comes to dynamic anatomy, and inked by Terry Austin, who had who was a part of that iconic X-Men run. Um, uh, it, the only thing that could have been better is if, um, you know, maybe Walt did the breakdowns and then Perez did the finishes, and then Austin inked it all. Um, and a, and, a, and a John Byrne uh, variant cover. I would have gone for all that. Um, so, so yeah, DC was was definitely in there. I'm sorry, and, and, and I, I forgot the other part of the question already because I, I had to speak on that one because that, that comic series spoke to me as a teenager growing up in the 80s, seeing this group of teenagers trying to work it out. Like they really tapped into something when they put that book together. Yeah, my guy says you have great tastes in artists with capital great. Like, yo, <laughs> it's really like crazy. It's, I don't think he's watched a lot of my interviews, and he pops in here, and I see like the I think it's a transformer behind you, and the dude's got like a thousand of them in his room back at his mom's crib, and he's obsessed with comics. And hearing you, and I'm like, this is crazy great timing. Like, it was meant to be that you went in this direction with this conversation. Man, it's a good conversation, man. I appreciate y'all having me again. Yeah, and it's it's cool because like we we barely even like touched the 80s you know and we're like we're this like, it's been so much time this is like perfect for me right like to me it doesn't matter yeah. if i have to talk to you 17 times if each time is going to be as delightful as this you know it's just a pleasure like this is an amazing way to spend a saturday awesome Sick. all right so you already have this established in this so you're you're into drawing you're into dancing you're into rhyming you're into comics. You're in, so you're into lore and literature. Do you read books also? Are you also into like the reading? Um, I, I go through um, reading phases where I, where I can jump into some sci-fi and 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 go down some rabbit holes. Um, and so I think the first time I did that was was the Foundation series, you know. But I would read. I, I read the entire series like within a month's time. Like so, I'd go through one yeah. book in like three or four days. I just wouldn't put it down because I just. You know, I don't ha- I don't have patience for, <laughs> for for books for the most part because I want to get to the resolution. And mm-hmm. now I don't find myself with those big chunks of time to digest as much as I could. But I, I, I need to get back to it because it practices a different kind of discipline. The only thing I've done is like business and and uh, and, and those type of um, books to, uh, you know, support me with, um, you know, job growth but that that's that's really the only place where i focused attention on books recently that's amazing i mean the fact that you like even are able to point out that it has a kind of discipline to it i like that i like because you know i read a lot of books in the last few years and the discipline is literally the best way to describe how you read books in volume Mm -hmm. you have to dedicate time to it and you have to give up netflix (laughs) i promise Kane. absolutely she, she gets an hour or whatever fair because sometimes it's a wise move to make sure she's happy like all the time mm-hmm. but like yo it takes a lot of like sacrifice to actually pull that off so i respect what you're saying a lot because it's very like aware and real with it um so you're like said around 17 ish i think that you started to get more serious with rhyming and I wonder why yeah. you started to get more serious with rhyme. Oh, you're right, because you did the, let me see, the recap thing happened. People said you were cool with it. And then what happens? Um, and then my homie plugged me into um, Cassius Clay Mack up in the Bronx. And he was a, a producer. And he was like, uh, I think I think uh, you need to meet one of my boys here. Um, and it was, um, it was, uh, after I had been doing like some open mics during freshman year of college and um, <laughs> getting served in um, MC battles in um, college parties, because that would happen. Like you go to the college parties and then every now and then 
like they throw on some beats and and the heads would just battle like right there in the spot and and like it, it was battles were everywhere it, it wasn't a stage thing it wasn't organized like you were always prepared to be called out or to call somebody else out and I was brash and I just started rhyming. Of course, I thought I was the best. And I would go into other people's schools and call them out. And you don't do that because it's their school for one, right? And they could be the worst rapper ever, but they're going to get love because it's in their school. Um, so you got to find a way to dismantle them. And if you can't do that, you are not winning on their ground. But of course, I thought I could do that. Um, and so after getting served a lot there, but learning and then coming back and then holding service, right? Um, that's where you start getting the respect. And that's where my man was like, I got to connect you to my boy Cassius Clay Mac. He's got a little in-home studio. And um, that's when I started working with a beat maker from the Bronx. Uh, Ca Cassius Clay Mac actually went on to, to then produce uh, a track on Biggie's second album. Um, uh, and the, 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 I think it's Niggas Bleed or Niggas, um, one or the other. Um, but he produced that track on that, on that album. Eventually, that's what he went on to do. Um, but he was like a hungry young beat maker. He had a little four track recorder in his basement, a um, little sure mic connected to it. And he was just looking for an MC to work with. But he was really into music theory. Right. And 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 he, he picked up on the formula. And, and, and he's a true Bronx native and, and being the birthplace, like he, he was keyed in. So he was like, here's how you lock it in. And he had me write in the the, the eight bar intros, 16 bars, eight bar hooks, 16 bars, eight bar hooks, maybe four bar bridge, 16 bar, bring it out. Um, he gave me such strict guidelines for the way that I was putting songs together back then um, that it, it, it really helped me, you know, develop as an artist. Plus, we were trying to get the best quality we could out of Hold the on. four track. I saw a Facebook post recently that said there were no bridges in hip-hop. Are there bridges in hip-hop? Yeah, there is. What, who said that? I don't remember. I sincerely don't remember. What? what like Dude, bridges? Like, yeah, yeah. Like, this, like a musical uh, bridge. Them. Like so I saw somebody say that. in a fa I don't remember who said it. I'm not going to lie. I saw it on Facebook. Yeah, no. And I was like, hold up, Breeze is talking about like back in the day times and specifically used the term bridge. And I'm like, I know what a bridge is and I believe there were bridges, but I stayed out of that because I'm trying not to argue on Facebook and waste time, right? Like it's not worth it. Yeah. But I saw that and it popped out at me and I'm a little bit going, wait, there are bridges, right? He just said that. Yeah. Okay, so I, no, absolutely. I just wanted to dead that because I think Breeze Ella Flowing knows a lot more about original hip hop than a lot of us do. Yes, yes, no, absolutely. There are absolutely bridges in hip hop. That's not a le legit. I I use them. I am not the the. I'm not the guy that invented using bridges in hip hop. Right. Like, no, it's not. it's been there since always, yeah. pretty much. I'd imagine. Like, and, uh, and, and it comes in a lot of different forms, right? Like the the scratch break right before that last verse is essentially the bridge it, it takes you over there right um so it, 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 it's you're, you're formatting it that way and then it opens up that four or that eight normally a four if you want a, a, a quick transition for something different um but you just want to change it up even if it's just like stretch out the beat and extend it a little bit and hit that then 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 and then like drop it again um it, there, there's all sorts of little little right places to put those things that um that 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 are universally formatted to be appealing when people listen to them because the way that people condition to listen to music from the motown era coming out of that um and so oh, that's the, huge. The, the best hip-hop was basically formatted around that same kind of formula and a lot of those old juice crew jams were formatted in a similar fashion Yo, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. This is actually big. Do you guys hear what he's saying? Because we're talking about like original hip hop. It's effectively, and we're saying the stuff that did well, we'll call it, stuff that maybe people love today. Effectively took successful popular music of another genre, formatted and structured it in a way that would be appealing to, lis appealing to listeners and use that magic to create appealing sounds ignoring perhaps a little bit personal ego and how they feel like things should be 
in order to make sure that there's more accessibility within their music. And that's an idea that stems from the eighties and stuff. Yeah. It's the tail end, right? It's when, it's when the tighten up started happening. It's when, um, you started seeing a little more crossover success and the, and the, the songs that were achieving that were the ones that were fit in the format. Now, the, now some of the best songs, like, you know, you, you think about my melody and, and when that dropped and like at those, point 16s like Ra was just going until he was done until he felt done until it felt like it was done and that's that's the essence that 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 we picked up on and we were like that's that dude right there right um as a, as a 15 year old on the bus going out to uh you know one of them summer camp trips or something like that um you know like like he, there was nothing like that but then the crossover success came in the format and then when they started doing the format, that's when the video started. They started investing in the videos. So most of the early videos that you see for a lot of these rappers, you you'll hear the formatting in those videos. But um, you know they they didn't make they didn't make the video for my melody when that came out. It was just rocking on the radio and it was it was moving that vinyl. Um, but that that was an amazing jam. I think it would it was better than some of the the more formatted songs that came out later. You know. No, but like I agree with you, and it like, so here's what happens. Sometimes we have these conversations in our twenty twenty something perspectives, right? Where what's good, what's bad, what's proper, because we see people make choices that are effectively pop marketing moves, and perhaps they work better, but it's not as maybe appealing as say the sonic soundscape of a great brave underground track like a Rakim would have been, right? Like that shit's yeah. fucking fire. It really is. But, like, I'm sure there were a lot of people that also tried to do it. Rakim did in some way that nobody's heard of to this day. And Rakim happened to be, like, the one that did it, right? And everyone yeah. else ended up going maybe here or there and making some choices along the way because there's business attached to it. So I think there's yep. this weird rose-colored view that all the people of the golden era, as we put it, were just, like, completely never willing to make pop choices. And I feel like that was never true, but it's kind of hard to like describe that to people who don't know a lot about it, but you're just like, yeah, they did that. And like, we fucked with Rakim and yo, looking back, everyone knows that one more than say a lot of the other ones, but you need more than just the Rakim to push an industry. Yes, absolutely. And, uh, but they all, they all, they, it all followed suit and it all followed you know the, the the same thing and then you know um it, it it evolved and you know it changed after that but uh you know that that's when you know commercial success is gonna is gonna start to change and, and alter things in in a lot of the different ways you know um and to your point like they, there was so many amazing mcs out there like so many like we're, we're just in the city um and, and it was it was such a special thing to be um because there was a, 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 a the, the 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 main angle in the 80s also was um it wasn't the the mimicry that i've seen in the past two decades right it, it was your your angle was your uniqueness that was your selling point right it was what is your angle and 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 then you would you would build this universe around these characters that you created right and some people went really far right um you know where, where they had to like you know really fit these different stereotypes within their groups but you know they were unique and and they had a a different angle from everybody else and that was encouraged at that time um, so that was what was special about wanting to be an MC or, or calling yourself an MC because you're like, hey, I, I've got something special. I've got my own voice. I got my own angle. Um, here it is. Um, and you, be, uh, you were becoming your own world. superhero. Exactly. That's amazing. <clears throat> exactly. And that would be to be an MC. Absolutely. Now, would you say that's different than being a rapper? Um. It, it, it is different. It, it's um, because it, it's it's uh, to, for me, MC embraces more of the, the cultural aspect of it. And that means you are a participant in the culture. 
um you know there there are some amazing people who can who can write lyrics really well um but i i don't know if i'd, I'd just put them down in the, in the term rapper because of the the stigma attached to just that word um especially by some of the purists right um so there i think the differentiation is like there's there's lyricists and then there's mcs more so than there's rappers and mcs like there's some people who write really great lyrics but they weren't out there they mm. weren't in the ciphers they weren't jumping up when we walked into you know the room screaming who won a battle they they weren't like they weren't they weren't in it to that extent um they weren't they weren't at different open mics they weren't um you know uh in different boroughs like rocking in different in the cut spots like rocking wills up on 125th where he would make his mixtapes with MCs who would come through, like they never touched that, right? But they were around just writing lyrics. Um, so, but that was where the culture was growing and that's where cultural exchange was happening. Um, and so that's to me is the, the differentiator. And, 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 it, and as it expanded and evolved past and after that, right? Like, um, you know, culture is where you, where you make it, where you connect and where you spread that um with others and and you can make that culture or you can join that culture but it, it, odds are it probably already exists in most major cities and then if it doesn't like it's easy to get people together because hip-hop just pulls people together like that and gives them a place where they can just uh feed off each other with a very special and unique kind of energy with the kind of music we do yeah i love what you're saying because it's all true to me at least like i do i agree with everything um we're actually trying really hard to not just myself but a bunch of us to like kind of pull off a bit more of an organization to the anglo hip-hop scene in montreal so, and honestly it just is like that it's this beautiful thing where people come through and everybody's got this unique talent and every there's so much great music you know too and everybody has these voices and ideas that they get to share and so many different walks of life and yeah some of it might be more hip-hop some of it might just be more rappers but just to watch this blending of stuff happen i think is pretty cool but um i think your your, your just insight is so cool like i know your life is also cool but like your insight is is you man i just watch you talk about stuff on youtube i'm not even gonna lie i would just totally watch that <laughs> um no nah, it's cool man like it's, it's like you hear it in your lyrics but like hearing you just expand on stuff man it's nice um so basically you link up with the producer dude we learn about the structuring yeah. of songs and how what happens at yeah. that point do you start like putting up music into the world what year is this also um, so that we can frame it man um you know it, it, my mom's did her thing right but growing up in a, in a single parent household and, and then you know with the old school mom you know there, there wasn't a lot of talk you know about anything too deep or or anything you know the past was always like this mystery to me like she wasn't she wasn't bringing up nothing she wasn't talking about nothing um it wasn't that kind of an open conversation relationship with moms right uh, um and so i made you know some 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 uh you know, odd decisions as I look back, but uh, I, I got with somebody around that same time that I'm starting to make music with my man, Mac. And um, the demo tape is starting to circulate. And um, we started a group um, that he was producing for us. And, and uh, it, was, it was the, we called ourselves the group home um, <laughs> right around 1991. And then uh, I remember we got a call from somebody um, and it, it, it sounded like it could have been, you know, that maybe even, but somebody called us from group home was like, y'all need to stop calling yourselves group home. Um, and, um, they were calling from a, we had, that's when caller ID first came out. They were calling from the offices, um, of the company. So then we were like, oh man. So you know right after we started seeing all the group home promotional stickers so we had to change our names from group home to um, the funky street urchins which was just terrible but we did it anyway and um it was me my man rock stay pooed my man foo live um we were like a leaders of the new school kind of kind of type of band um we got our demo tape over to stretch and bob they let us come on uh hold on you gotta talk and about i remember more about that the, i literally the just they gave us was hilarious 
Yeah, because I don't. I think I, they was clowning us on the low, but they was being really cool about it. So yeah, tell us a bit about that. Yeah, so Stretch and Bobito, to you, makes a whole lot of sense. For me, people kept saying it. I'm like, hold up, what's a fucking Stretch and Bobito? I know the answer now. Last Saturday, we watched the documentary about uh, Stretch and Bobito. So now yeah. I know what it is to be a Stretch kid and a Bobito kid. So when Big yeah. Zoo said he was a, a Bobito kid, I didn't know what he meant. Then I heard about that, and I'm like, oh, that makes a lot of sense, actually. I've heard Big Zoo rap a whole bunch of times. That makes total sense to me now. Yeah. So with that, why don't you share a little bit about an experience like that, like actually meeting them and going, going through that whole, like, rut or whatever. Just talk about that, you know, and how important that is so that people can understand actually how cool that really is. Oh, man, I, I just remember that night, like, um, you know, riding the train over, um, up, up, up to uptown Manhattan, the one train up there to where the studio was at all the way uptown. And it was like in this old, like, kind of like, um, it was like a campus, but it looked like a, like a, a church and we had like go downstairs and it was a cool waiting area and all these cool cats hanging in there. And it's me and my boys. And this is our first time, like on any kind of platform. Right. Um, uh, and I'm like 20 and, uh, you know, just excited as all get up. Um, and they call us in this in the studio and they, they you know, they, they just ask us about our music and we, we, you know, go through our spiel because our angle was, you know, we are the group home and, you know, we, we, uh, we, um, you know, my one dude was like the court jester of the group. He was like the funny dude. My man Roxy Pooh was like super serious. I was like the lyrical, lyrical dude. Um, so we each had our role in the group. And then we started spitting and um, we did pre-prepared songs, right? So we, we literally did routines up in there. We was like doing each other's fill-ins and like doing like leaders of the new school type fills. Um, and so when we left, they were like, yo, they was doing routines. Yo, that was special. <laughs> um but we were like super excited. We we took that as love. Like we were like, yo, we just got dap. And then all the homies were like, yo, we heard you on Stretch and Bob. Like it was like, you know, top of the world. Like it, it, it was nothing like it. Um, yeah, and I've gotten to go back there many times since, right? And and and, and that that's a blessing in and of itself. Um, but that first time was like, yo, it was it was like, and it was good to do it with the homies. But I think that was also um, one of the things that. I had eventually come to learn that, you know, the, the producer, even though he went with the, uh, the group idea, he didn't really want to do that. Um, and he, and, and, and he had always wanted me to just do my own thing. Um, but, uh, I think throughout my early career, like there was always, uh, uh, uh I, I always felt like, you know, I would work better as a part of a group than, um, uh, than doing my own thing. And I think that, you know, maybe it was part confidence thing, but also like, um, you know, I didn't really have a lot of family here. And, you know, oftentimes you got a crew like that's that's like your your family and you really, you know, you, you want the best for them uh, along with the best for yourself. Um, but it's hard to get it all. And oftentimes people don't want to collaborate with you when you come with a lot of baggage. Um, and so uh, definitely some learns from early on. But that's the earliest memory was me bringing the crew through. Um, but you know, sometimes you reflect on it and you're like, you know, what, what, what could have been if it had just been me on a, on a solo tip, like focusing on just self from back then. And then once you're established, you can, you can work some other things out. So, um, you know, it's, it's, a it's, it's just, a as I reflect on it, right. Like all these thoughts start coming up. No, but and, these are uh, like really important thoughts, right? Cause there's a lot of people yeah, today man. that don't know how to approach things. Like a lot of people, like if you were to say to me, is it better to be in a crew or not? I don't know. I did this really solo thing for a while. And the truth is maybe I would have been smarter to work with people. <clears throat> maybe I would have learned a lot of lessons in life working with people with regards to compromise and having to deal with people at that age that I had to learn later on in life. Whereas if I was the yeah. star of my own show as I was the whole time, it was a little bit harder to learn how to work with people later on in life. So maybe there were blessings in the situation that you had because there's no way you work with two other people, everybody playing a role and didn't have to learn a little one-two about politicking in the process. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. 
Listen, that's that's I, I appreciate you for bringing that up because I, as I as I think about it, right, and I wouldn't want anyone that I've ever worked with to to feel any any kind of way about it, and and uh, and I have no remorse for it because of the skills that it taught me was just that, right? Um, and, and oftentimes I would I would lead these these uh, these groups or these or these teams, and 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 uh, you know I learned from each experience, you know, like a different different lessons in leadership and, and and currently that that's that's my profession right now and I'm, I'm really good at what i do which is which i'm thankful for um but a lot of that was transferable skills from having been in those type of situations and working with so many different personalities like and and you know artistic personalities are some of the strongest persons <laughs> to try to build consensus with you know so if you can get a group of six, seven, five, whatever it is, however many on the same page and moving in the same direction, like you have developed some really solid leadership skills. Leadership skills. Yeah. Yeah. I was just about to say legit. It's oh it's another gosh. people don't understand when dealing with our community and if you're able to get us organized. You, mm -hmm. that's another type of leadership. That's a whole nother level. It's it, it's presidential type of like qualification. People don't realize, you know, like it's very difficult. It's not easy to get. And then artists, us as artists. Oh my gosh. Get it even harder. Yeah. Yo, I have big respect for that. Honestly, trying to, trying to deal with people is not my forte in life. I'm learning on the fly real fucking quick. I did a whole interview with Iron <laughs> Solomon and didn't smile. I did. I forgot to smile the entire fucking thing. So like you're seeing, I actually have to sit there. Okay, make sure to. Smile. I heard him laugh. Smile. Make sure to smile. Yo, that's that's the you know, as well like skills I'm learning on the fly, in moments like yeah, that, man. because it's important stuff, and uh, so it's cool to be able to be able to even just sharing that with us, right? So you're reflecting back on life, right? And everyone does that, right? That's a huge thing. Yeah, and then the fact is there are multiple ways to perceive a moment. And sometimes what happens with us when we reflect is we get fixated on a perception and we don't mm -hmm. always see the other perception. So I don't know about your world and the universe, etc. but just being able to look at your life and have multiple perceptions kick in is just a blessing to everyone because it can remind us all that regardless of how we see things, it's just a perception of the reality. Yeah, man. All right, so you basically went to Stretch and Bobito with your peeps, and are you also performing in a more formal way, or is it still battling in the streets? Are you all making albums? Like, you got to understand, for for you, it's like a blitz of, like, your life. For me, it's like, I mean, there's a lot of possibilities and tears of what could have happened over that little period of time you're describing. Yeah, like, yeah, I don't yeah. fucking know. Are you, like, hanging out with peoples? Like, I don't know anything, right? Like... Dude, I'm I'm um I, I was the a sober MC for a long time, but I was rocking with my man from Washington Heights. Was in my crew. We'd go up to Thayer Street um, around 1991. Uh, he started uh, introducing me to the Magical Leaf, and um, you know that the whole MC game transformed into something completely different. We were doing music seminars um in 92 93 94 um new music seminar um what's a music seminar? world music seminar um so-and-so's sister is connected to so-and-so has a seminar seminar like whatever the seminar was that that's a, that's where you went to connect with people there was no internet there so was seminar, seminar seminar being like a bunch of people listening to a talk is that what you mean by seminar Talks. Talks. The bigger ones were organized into multiple events. So there'd be like events where they'd listen to your demo and give you feedback. And like Ice T would be on the panel and then chastise me for being too eager because I had only started rapping a few years earlier and telling me that I had no idea um, what I was talking about. Um, I was so pissed at that seminar session right there, um, but it was some of the best advice that anybody had ever given me. But he was telling me this from up on the panel. Yo, cause like even my guy Ismail is like interesting. Like, yo, I don't know anything about what you're describing. This is literally the first I've heard of these musical seminars. Cause yo, I can see the the Facebook live versions of these things and what it turned into 20 years later. I can tell you how to recreate this on Twitch in like 
in an hour or two. So I could tell you all about how to do this now, but it's so fascinating to know that this actually stems from something. Dude, I'm going to give it to you just like this. Think of music comic con. Wow. And not, and not South by Southwest, but South by Southwest may be the closest that you can come to the the feeling of the the seminars that used to happen there was new music there was how can i be down down in atlanta um and these there would be multiple shows going on around it the new the music seminar battle for world supremacy which i was not good enough for back then but i got good enough by the time blaze came out um but that was the battle to be in like just seeing like grim reaper or judgmental from chicago jump up in there and just tear people up um supernatural and the battle for world supremacy like so these were all battles x-men rock raider battle for world supremacy like so yeah, hold up, hold up. this is all battles the seminar so the seminar yeah, was like these, a conference and then the first like big level battles so so uh, we got to break this down because again no uh, at least i never heard about this so i want to make sure i don't sound like this for the next guy um so you got the seminar and we'll call this like a conference, like where a company rents out a hotel and shit. We'll just like for whatever. And yeah. then throughout yes. the day, there's a schedule of events and shit that's going on. And within that yep. schedule of events, you have talks, maybe listening sessions where like mm -hmm. people of, of the industry are congregating and linking up with people like yourself on the come up. So in a yep. sense, it's like fucking the YouTube conference, VidCon. It's literally like VidCon, the YouTube conference. Mm -hmm okay yep. okay um and within that realms is this battle rap culture that's kind of brewing as these different events are happening because you know if we think about yep. battle rap right we haven't gone this far back yet on this show one time yet the earliest anyone's ever really talked about is like 2000 right so you're like dropping some shit that's going all the way back all the way back is what it sounds like to me yep. unless i'm misinterpreting the situation no 93 94. wow that's crazy knowledge nuggets right there. Okay, so you're at the musical seminars and you're competing in this battle rap circuit that is kind of coming. Oh no, no, I, I I couldn't even get on the card back then. I, I ain't had no crowd okay. yet. <laughs> I love your humility, my guy. My come up didn't happen till around ninety five, ninety six is uh is when I finally started making a little bit of a dent. Um, <laughs> but before that, I was just I was like, please listen to my demo, and and like, yo, you would package your demo tape. Like we made, when we were group home, we made little houses. We would cover over the, the, the McDonald's Happy Meals and we, we made it look like a house and we would put like a piece of chocolate in there, put our demo tape, photos, stickers. Like you made it a big deal because you wanted that A&R to listen because most of them tapes ended up in a big pile. And if they wasn't presented right, nobody was listening to it. Man, yo, you know how cool that is that you're sharing this, right? Yo. Because I think, like, people have this glamorized view of the past where people didn't have to do shit like that. Like, somehow that wasn't part of the game back in the day. No, and I swear it is because I talk to people in the role that I'm in a lot and I observe a lot of things. So I'm not trying to name names or be a negative nilly or anything. But there is 100% this idea that people weren't doing things like that that is fucking floating out around there. So it's actually really, like, for me... Like hearing you say this shit right now, oh my gosh, in the meta conversations of my life, I was like, you don't know how grateful I am that you're sharing this with me. I'm kind of happy you letting me let this out, man. At least this is being, uh, you know, added to the annals, right? You know, someday somebody's going to come back and pin it all together. and Hopefully they could, this could uh, fill in some of that. Ah. <laughs> this should be written on the walls with some zoo. <laughs> I love this. This is a great chat, honestly, Breeze. I uh, I'm really enjoying this. You're a fucking. You can feel like your leadership, educational tones of this. It's like you understand the vibe of what we're going for, and you're just running with it, and that's perfect. That's what we love here. Hey man, this this is like I said, it's an awesome platform to have. Thank you again, man. Thank you again. Honestly, it's more our pleasure. I must say that for real. Like it's just a gift, yo. Like we, I. I did album reviews for like four years. I mean, I still kind of do them, but like I've been loafing because this is way more fun. And people would like tell me to Google things a lot. As in like talking about New York, Rablums, as I'm talking about this and that. And like, I tried. 
I stopped trying. I went through a phase where I tried to Google bars and I tried to do it a lot. And then I had to stop because, yo, unless there's some back ass fucking forum that happens to have a debate on that shit somewhere contextualized in some hidden fucking shit that doesn't exist anywhere, nine times out of ten, it's a waste of time. And then you end up with Urban Dictionary. So if it's on Urban Dictionary, okay. If it's not, like, it's a waste of time. So having a guy like you explain things and having all the people, especially like, yo, shout out Flacco Bayo, man, because without him, obviously, we wouldn't be here having this conversation and all of his insight. It's, yo, it makes me better at what I do, and it helps me understand the, both the music and all the choices people make in the music better. And that's something that's really hard to find, is the history of why people make choices. Yeah. Um, but you still seem to have gone from, you're, you're going through, you're participating in it too. So you're, you're there and you're showing love. That's important. And you're handing out tapes with houses and you put effort into that, but you're present. So you're making that effort to be there, which means you probably had to spend some money and put dollars in somebody's pocket to get there. <laughs> yeah, man. Oh yeah. Ooh. Oh yeah. It also means um, it's not free but, back then either to do things. Sorry. I'm, I'm kind of nah, down. Nah, you, paid shit. For, you paid to go to the seminar and then the seminar was expensive, right? Um, you paid to go to the events afterwards because they wasn't always included. Um, and, and you're paying your dues. Like you're just, you're just trying to get on. Like soon after the seminars, um, the lyricist lounge started popping off. And so then I'm paying my dues there too. Right. I'm showing up at, uh, at 7 PM knowing they ain't even loading in till about nine 30. Right. Um, but I'm there at 7 PM and there's already five people ahead of me in the line. You're on top. And, you're early. Yeah. And I don't get to touch the mic until um, 1.30 in the a.m. when most of the crowd left um, because I just, you know, wasn't up there yet. And I, and I had to pay my dues. And so, you know, by the time they got to, to me on the list, it was like, oh, it's super late night. No one left in the, in the spot. And, um, you know, I'm trying to light it up as best I can. So, you know, the, 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 the seven or eight people left in the room will, will, uh, will vibe with me when I show back up. Um, and so that's going on also around that time. We're still shopping that demo tape. We, we, we're getting feelers, but no one's really biting. Um, and then life hit and, um, you know, it, it hit really hard. And uh, I had to fall back from the everything for a little bit. Um, fell off the scene for like a, a good two years. Uh, had to deal with some some personal matters. Um, and finally, my man Cassius Clay Mac hit me up like, yo, um, I know you don't rhyme no more, but I made this beat. And that's when he hit me with the beat for Forsaken. The, and if you never heard it, it, it had this vocal hook that went, my God, my God why hast thou forsaken me and he had like the best piano loop ever for it uh, and i just kind of like like wrote like a couple of different different stories to this beat and um the 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 uh, two perfect like 24 bar verses and they just fit really good on it and i sent it not sent i'm thinking i'm sending it to him i went to his crib and recorded it because he didn't send anything back then and that's when he had first gotten um in ADAP, which is a big deal in um 95. stopping can you explain what that means yeah it was uh, basically vhs tapes were being um leveraged to record vocals and they could record um up to eight tracks comfortably uh, with really good quality plus it was the, the digital strip allowed you to uh queue up different regions for the first time in ways that you couldn't do with the four track before that what would he mean? So, because um, uh, the VHS tapes have the um, the digital code on it where you can line them up. You could so you can like you could edit a lot more efficiently on an ADAT. So he could bring me back to the top of the track or top of the verse or wherever it was and like automate that for the first time. With the four track, I had to hit it from top to bottom. I could not miss. So there was no punching in. So this ADAT era is effectively when it goes from you have to be able to one take your shit to you can like actually come back in at another point or am I mistaken? For the it? home studio. 
for the home studio. Yeah, we're talking about... There was always the studio that you could yeah. pay for to go to. But we're it, talking the we home studio that. stuff because that's the more interesting yeah. things. Everybody knows that the fancy yeah. studios can do the fancy studio stuff. But yeah. y'all were like the inception point of golden era greatness that we idolize and fetishize today everywhere that's not New York City, right? Like that's the shit. Like that's yeah. where it's at. So you're describing yeah. not just what you're doing, but what everybody that probably anybody I ever listened to was going through some version of as well. Yeah. That's why it's fucking cool. Yeah. And each each home lab had a really <clears throat> different sound. Like Cassius Clay Mac was like a master with nothing from before that. Our four track joints would would knock. Um, so when he got the A dat, that was it. We stopped paying for the studio that we would go to after recording the four track stuff. And we just started doing everything in his crib. But that song in particular was one that, you know, he had some partners who also wanted to, you know, get more involved in the uh, the, the music game. And, and one of them was a lawyer by the name of Carlos. Another one was uh, Sean Prez, who went on to uh, start doing promotions for a bad boy. And he's like the president of promotions of bad boy now. Right. Um, so so Sean and 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 Mac used to always work together to throw parties. There was sound plus rhythm productions and. I would help Mac carry crates into the parties and we'd throw parties at Demerara's and, you know, different spots in the cities. We did a lot of $5 hollas. Hold um, on. What's a $5 holla? I mean, it sounds like it's pretty it, much in the name. It's it's more about feeding the bar. You just pay $5 to get in, but that $5 is going to us, you know, to the, to the crew that's providing the sounds, you know, sound plus rhythm productions. And so, um, they wanted to get into the record game. And so they, they, they invested into that one song and we pressed up the vinyl for um, Forsaken. And then the flip side was the song Dip Dip. And um, we, uh, we put it out there in the world and, and, and it, got, it got a lot of really good feedback. Like all the underground stations started picking up on it really quickly. Um, and then we made it on the, um, the Five Deadly Venoms of, of Brooklyn, thanks to PF Cut. So PF Cutton added us to his segment on that mixtape, and that's one of the most the like, five deadly. legendary mixtapes of that era. Five Deadly Venoms of Brooklyn. PF Cutton was, was a big DJ in New York City yeah. scene, the New York City like uh, yeah. hip hop scene period, which was pretty much the uh, hip hop scene of the nation. You know, like the DJs that were big in New York City, were kind of like big everywhere at the time, essentially, because they were the ones providing the mixtapes everybody was getting. And P.F. Yeah. Cutting was definitely one of them. Yeah. And this He also, was didn't he also do yeah. um, uh, work with um, Smooth the Hustler and Trigger the Gambler? Yeah, I'm I believe a... he did. He, I, I don't I mean, even I know who those people like, are. But but five deadly venoms was the was the cassette right there. Okay, so basically you got on that thing, and that was it. Um, opened up a lot of venues for shows. Um, um, started to get my, my 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 name out there. Made it a little easier to get a little further up on the open mic list now. Um, and uh, and then um. We followed it up with the Dip Dip remix and this other song called I Heard It. And we did that one with Nervous Records. And that was our first time working with the label. So the same crew took me over to Nervous Records. We worked on that. We did some video work for it. Um, and um, it was uh, it was it was cool because that one then got picked up on Hot 97. And Red Alert was the first person to start playing that Dip Dip remix. And he would play it on his uh, his five o'clock free ride that he would do. And that was in 97. Um, and so then, the, you know, the buzz started growing more from from getting some more burn from from that kind of exposure uh, on that level with that song. But um, we were trying to figure out what the next song was going to be. And I was writing a lot of stuff that was, um, you know, it, it wasn't progressing in the direction that, you know, that we, we'd, have, we'd have all liked to have seen as a group. Um, and then I saw Sound Plus Rhythm investing in someone else, right? And, and of course, you know, I, I started feeling a little um, jealous that they were investing their time in this other artist on the label, although this dude was dope. Because um, it was me, it was this other guy, Thief in the Night. Thief in, Thief in the Night was awesome. Um, and then uh, there was this uh, 
was I forget the third guy's name, but he was a sick lyricist. I think his name was uh, uh, Mr. Cruz or Felix Cruz. It might have been Felix Cruz, yeah. Um, but he was up in the Bronx and he was nasty. So they were just trying to diversify, you know, their investments. They they didn't they didn't say they weren't working with me. I still had access to the studio. They were still feeding me with beats. I was writing, um, but I got uh, my ego got in the way. And, and, uh, and it made me tell them that I was seeking different representation. So then I ended up sitting across the table from, um, what's Eminem's lawyer's name again? Paul. Paul Rosenberg. Um, Paul Rosenberg. I, I have a meeting with Paul Rosenberg. At the time he was representing Eminem and uh, Thurston Howe. And he was like, Breeze, I know who you are. What are you looking for? Um, and we started talking, I played him some jams and he was like, all, all right, all right. And he was, he was talking about, you know, how he was giving me the precursor and let me hear like some more of Eminem's jams, like off the, off the, 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 the demo tape when Eminem just had the six songs on the demo. And, um, he was telling me how M's about to blow and all this other stuff to set up a follow-up meeting with him. Um, I go back to the other dudes and they're like, you know, let's, let's try to work something out. And so I never followed up with Paul Rosenberg, probably the, the biggest of many big mistakes that I probably made along the way. <laughs> but that one right there. <laughs> I mean, I totally can appreciate what you're saying right now. I mean, how many, it's like saying, okay, like I knew what Bitcoin was in 2010. That's a real fact in my life. I knew what Bitcoin was in 2010 when uh -huh. a dollar would get you more than one Bitcoin. Okay, a dollar would get you more than and imagine if I just put like a hundred dollars into those bitcoins. Yeah. And then what I you know, you just everyone has that yeah. moment. That's what it feels yeah. like listening to you tell me that you were listening to M and M's pre released material and Paul Rosenberg's like, My God, fucks with you And you're like, Nah. Now he didn't say that. I okay. can't say that. All right. He he wasn't he I wasn't like he, he wanted he wanted a follow up, right? So I appreciated the opportunity to follow up, right? But that's where, you know, depending on how you show up, it depends on how you blow up sometimes, right? Mm. Um, but I didn't even follow up. And that's a fuck up because these people will not open up the door for you again. Right. Especially once the train starts moving. That's it, you're done. That's a huge and knowledge I blew nugget. A, a, more than one person in that in that area, because oftentimes it was that ego piece, um, and and it's 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 weird because it's like the, the 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 skill in the art form itself almost pushes and propels that ego to the front because so much of it was driven by that. So much of the appeal of it was that you know I, I, you know I'm bad, and it, you know when you got a you know. Uh, uh, it was like the explosion of emotion from an oppressed people when you, when you think about the birth of hip hop in and of itself, right? Um, and so a lot of it is bravado and and it's hard to separate that. And that's what led to that rift that finally separated me from the Sound Plus Rhythm guys right before they, they two years later, they're doing songs on Biggie's album, right? Had my ego not gotten in the way, I could have sat in the cut and been positioned for a lot better because by the time I got to reaching out to Sean Prez again, he was like, straight up breeze. I'm so far from that listening to demo tape shit right now. Um, and it hurt to hear that. But at the same time, I had to respect it because I was the one that stepped off. Um, and so then, you know, it's it's one meeting after another with, with different labels. I'm sitting there with the heads of Raucous and they're same thing. Breeze, we know where you are, but you know, it, the, the, the record game just isn't what it, when it was just a little while ago. Like they're getting ready to, you know, finalize their deals and, and turn over their, you know, you know, most of their control, their stuff to the, the deal they're working on with priority. And um, they were about to change into a different kind of label at that point. They weren't really picking up anybody off the street anymore. Um, but again, they knew they knew the name. They wished me well. Um, there was respect sat down with uh, Steve Rifkin in his office, spit some bars for him. That's right when Alcoholics and, and Wu-Tang were taking off. Um, but there was uh, nothing really there either for that. And, and that's when right before, right, right before that, um, or right around that time was when um, you started seeing the bad boy stuff start taking off. 
and the entire industry started moving towards that that kind of uh you know that that really polished sound party vibes um you know the, it was like uh the uh conscious rappers were almost being an intentionally uh barred from being a part of the uh the, the mainstream um it, it was like a, a hard shift um that started happening um and so having lost those connects and being in between the only place left to go for me was the the underground scene in new york and the battle scene and then there was also the 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 indie chitlin circuit throughout the country where every now and then you you get a flown here or there to do a show here and there because you had some vinyl that was spinning out a while ago before that and so the battle scene was another place to keep your buzz going and keep your buzz alive and uh, i found some success there because i was uh i was really good at timing and dropping punchlines. Mm. i have seen what you're talking about in my youtube discoveries of timing and punchlines. somebody called you like your m&m and then you came in, and I'm not going to lie in that one mime, and you came in like a finessed Eminem style with your timing and your punchlines and destroyed him. <clears throat> that was the truth of it. He may have mocked you for it, but you crushed him. And I was like, mm, I don't even need to watch whatever else. That, you know, Breeze won that one. I don't know what battle it was. It was just in a slew of shit I was watching. But I was like, yo, that's fair, man. You really had that shit on lock. That's, uh, at least from what I saw. Um, that's crazy, though, because what you said was kind of big, right? Like, Something that I don't think people realize is you might be friends with people today, um, right? And maybe today y'all are working together. And I can think of an example that's not related to me, but just of two people that were like once upon a time doing real well. You know, they were they were tight, you know. And then six, seven years later, one of them is like in another sphere of existence and the other one's not maybe. Like he still kind of thinks they're like the same level of friends. He hits them up. The follow-up isn't like it used to be. And it makes me realize that maybe there are some people who might believe that the relationships and connections that exist in your life today are are going to be there two, three years from now. And that, that it's just like an implied thing. And I think the lesson from what we can take from what your, your uh, story is that sometimes it's not even true. Sometimes when the time comes, even if everybody loves it, it's just that unfortunately the time is no longer what it was and the people are no longer in the same position to be able to do what they once did meaning that you now have to go find new networks and new ways to approach life and this happens to so many of us so many of us go through moments that are exactly like that i mean i'm pretty sure most people do i don't think most people actually do the right thing the first time like i don't actually think that that's common you know like that's that miracle shit that hollywood sells you know, that's that like actor rap, as I think you put it at one point in your career. Um, that would, like, you know, like, is it bad? Is it good? I don't know. But the authenticity is attractive in 2021. So you on a good path in today's market. <laughs> well, that's a good thing. You know, I did glaze over another huge segment of um, my, 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 um, my upbringing when I was working with the Cash Clay Mac. And that was the, um, the first time I was on Hot 97. So even though that was the first time my records were playing on Hot 97 was when the Dip Dip remix came out in the, in the, in the late 97. In 95, there was a show called The Mike Check Show on Hot 97, and it was hosted by The Furious Five. And um, that's when the personal things were happening in my life, and I was about to quit rhyming altogether. And I was telling my man, Mark Caraballo up in the Bronx, up on, he lived right there, right near Yankee Stadium. And I was at his crib and I was like, Mark, I think I'm going to quit. And he was like, nah, man, chill, chill, chill. Um, you need to, um, you need to, there's a show. You got to call in. You got to call in. You got to get on. So I, I, we call and they're like, who's, what are the odds you're going to get on the show? Right. And um, the dude's like, you know, Hot 97, who's, who's calling? I'm like, yo, Breeze, you know, I wanted to, you know, see if I could rhyme. And he's like, all right, you know, let's, let's, let's see what's up. Um, and they put me on hold and then they open up the mic and um, I get to spit. And then on the mic check show, the Furious Five would, if you, if you caught a good, if you caught a good flow, they would do this thing. They would just chant. Everything for them was a chant, right? 
and chance for everything. So if you did a good rhyme, they'd be like, you did your thing, homie. You did your thing. You did your thing, homie. You did your thing. Or if your rhyme was whack, they'd be like, that was doo-doo. That was doo-doo. That... So you did not want to get that second one, right? So um, I remember having listened to the show before. Like I was nervous, but I, I, I gave it all I had, right? I was like, what, what do I got to lose? They told me to stay on the line. And then Mickey Benson, who was managing the, the, the Furious Five at the time, was like, you know, you know, they want you to come down to the studio next week. And so we go down there and we're standing out in front of Hot 97. And we're like, we're super on time, but we're like, do we just walk in? And we walk in and they're like, we don't, we're not expecting you. You can't come in. And so we start walking out and then we see Melly Mel and all the others come in and, and I'm like, yo, Breeze. And they're like, oh, Breeze from the other week. Come on, come with us, come with us. And they bring us up into the studio and we're in the studio with the Furious Five. And then they started having me come in um, every week as like their, their um, they, they, I was like their new school assassin. So, uh, you know, anytime like somebody would come on and, you know, try to get lyrical on them with the new stuff, like they'd be like, oh, Breeze. You were the on. young gunner. You were the I was pimple. the young gunner. I was the young yep. gunner there and I, I, I was there to do my thing and, you know, I would be up there in the studio and they would let me do the rhyme cipher with them at the start of the show every week. And um, every week, Melly Mel would write a new rhyme for the show. This dude was so disciplined with lyricism. But to be in the room in the presence of that greatness. And at first, Flash was there just for like one le- one more show. And then they kind of started going their, their, their separate ways with that. Um, but then it was Tony Touch, who was DJing for the Furious Five. And Angie Martinez was the engineer on the show. And so I got to spend a lot of time with all of these people early on. And that's what kind of brought me back into the music. And then um, eventually um, I started rocking with Freedom Williams, who knew Melly Mel and the Furious Five. And then Freedom invited me to his studio and he was putting together a, a rap group a la Wu-Tang called the Black Knights and they put together a 12 inch vinyl called Who's the Black Man and I got to drop some bars on that about riding over the Alps like Hannibal um, and and all this other stuff like it was it was like some some uber righteousness but it was good from that a group of us from the Black Knights spun off into the hypodermic needles and um, that was with um, the homies from um, from Elm City up in Connecticut and um, it was me, Napalm Bomb and um, Nondescript were the MCs. Sonata Virtuoso was the the beat maker and um, we dropped a single called Always. And so that's where the vinyl started to come. And then it was time for me to do my own vinyl. And that's when Cassius Clay Mac hit me with the the Forsaken track. So I can't say I was completely out of the way. and, And dude, when history is this dense and there's, that many brushes with greatness it gets hard to keep it all lined up sometimes so forgive me for uh being a little mixed up with it but it has definitely been an interesting career to say the least very interesting i was gonna um, say that like, just one say point. like even i can appreciate how fucking ridiculously i think the entire anybody can appreciate how ridiculous it is First of all, everybody knows who Angie Martinez is today. So that was like a name drop that's relevant, right? Because she's on YouTubes and shit, you know? Like, people know who that is, right? That was, like, really, like, a significant thing. We all know who who the five are because, like, I mean, we all do. It's just how do you not? It's impossible. Uh, you, like, brought up Grandmaster Flash just all casually. Like, he was there that one time. And then, you know, I'm like, what the fuck? And then you're on the radio, busting freestyles you're like their pit bull just to prove Hot 97 is a like, huge is a huge name huge i was gonna i was name. gonna ask i was gonna ask um we still didn't get to blaze battle on hbo right no nah, not even yeah no but this is just <laughs> which like... is like where which is where like which is like from a from a from a from a super hip-hop head new york kid you know all the way it was to me dumb. Like that's like I look at somebody I look said at the, idea there. You know idea. You bad yeah. like you. Um, that, we knew each other. Yes, I can't say that he was a friend, but we no, we knew my, each my other guy Ismail, sure. who's been watching this, fucking loves idea. 
So whatever you can say about idea would be a wonderful thing. He's good peoples, but it, it, it was never more than just a pound or what's up. Um, and, and I've heard good things that, that I can, that I can say for sure, you know, but the, the, the Midwest battle scene was coming up very differently than the, uh, the New York one at the time. And it, it was, it was, a. Uh, it was another interesting scene, just like the, the the New England scene was starting to develop also around that time in the late nineties. And they were starting the battle scene also. So you got Scribble Jam like blowing up with the with the with the Midwest and the and some of the southern um states where underground hip hop was starting to bubble. And then up north it was the, the Super Bowl battles um that would happen up at the Middle East. And uh, a lot of those dudes, like Sage Francis, who eventually then migrated over oh to the, the Scribble Jam circle and started doing damage down there. I met Sage Francis in the streets of New York in those late ninety days. Like he was battling some like ducks up on um, up on um, in the, in, the, in the West Village, and um, there was like more of them than him. So then, of course, you know, I stepped in and I was like, "Yo, let's go!" And um, you know, it was it was us battling these other dudes, and then after that. He came with us. I think Lifelong was there too, to um, BBQs or, or some. We we had some lunch or some restaurant or something like that. We were just building on MC and stuff like that. But he was like, he was just raw. Like he was like so raw MC, like just coming down from up north, like just in the streets battling dudes. Like that that like I said, he <coughs> he he could wear the title. He could say I'm, I'm an MC like and he's Sage got somebody. Francis. Yeah, who can, no, who can vouch for that? When I first saw even though Sage I paid Francis, for his dinner that night, he never paid me back. <laughs> that's amazing, my guy. Sage Francis is huge for me. At least, I mean, look at me, my guy. I fucking saw Sage <laughs> Francis for the first time. I and like, cause yo, it was random as fuck. I discovered him by like yeah, some yeah. guy told me about Escape Artist was the track in like 2012 or 13 or something, and I had never heard yeah. anybody speed up on a hook like that. I was like, wait, you can go fast on the hook. Like, you don't have to slow down the hook, and it blew my fucking mind. I got into That guy makes music for people like me. If there was ever a guy who makes music for people like me, it's fucking Sage Francis. That Life album is one of my favorite projects of all time, but nobody knows what the fuck it means, so I never even bring it up. Dude. He he, he was one of those dudes we used to rock with all the time up in, up in the wow. up in Boston scene when we started going up there and rocking with him and acrobatic mr lift uh seven l and esoteric um, me, eh? rex like you know those scenes were were so intertwined and there was that battle scene up there there was a the battle scene in new york and then blaze was the first magazine to endorse a battle and the, the first battle was at tramps and tramps was a really awesome venue with one of the best sound systems also super clean and crisp and I remember the first Blaze battle happened, and Pre the Honey Dark won it, and no, and and and, and Pre totally took it, deserved it one hundred percent. I was just mad I wasn't in it, so I remember walking around backstage for that first one, like, "Yo, why am I not in this battle? I should be. I'll rip anybody." And it was that bravado, right? That you know, and I'm shouting this out loud the way we used to, because Stronghold when we started forming as a crew. Like we used to walk through Times Square screaming, "Who won a battle?" Like Hold on, though. People Hold out on. Of you, yeah. you, 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 you. All right, Flacco. Do one at a time, right? The strongholds. Are, know. You don't have to I know. explain. I know. I know. The, it, I know. You even yeah. breeze past. Breeze. You even breeze past the, the blaze battle. Listen, he's just ever <laughs> flowing. That's, That's what we need this here. This is a huge thing that, like, you know, like that. That was the first yeah. real honest. A uh, commercialization of battle rap to the yes. world, presentation yes. of yes. hip hop battle rap to the world. Those blaze battles, oh, absolutely. And absolutely. then after that came the um, fight clubs on eight on MTV, yep. and yep. and the Smack DVDs. You know, yep. but but first those blaze battles came. Yep. Yo, that's interesting. On HBO. Yo, you gotta on understand. HBO, I've talked to a lot HBO of HBO and. They had RZA and Capadonna, who were signed artists at the time, on a major record label, participating with the guys like Breeze and like Punkethead, 
uh, 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 I guess, uh, idea would be another name that, like, you know, yep. Yo, like, idea is pretty cool. cool. Like, I mean, maybe you don't think he's pretty. I don't know how much you listen to idea, Flacco. From what I've seen of your Facebook post, I'm going to assume not a lot. Um, it's all right for me. I listen to idea. I like Ismail is like gets us to he has to tell us what albums to review here and there. So he got us to do his first one, the first idea and abilities project. And yo, that guy read some shit, man. And he made songs yeah. that were so abstract and out there that they could be taken to philosophy courses in university. And for real, you could build an entire course around that first album, Firstborn. Ismail posted it there. And, like, that's how, like, yo, because we went through that shit. And I'm like, yo, there is some serious, like, you wrote a song about being a fish and shit that questions humanity and whatnot. I'm like, that's, like, a level of, like, songwriting that I can see how it's not appealing to the mass majority of people. But if you a thinker, that shit's gold when you want to go thinking mode. Listen, man, like... He he could wear the MC title also because he he was he was definitely out there where he was at. But then I know he was always ready to go at a moment's notice, right? And it's it's unfortunate that he passed as soon and as early as he did, right? Um, but he he could wear the title for sure. Um, but yeah, that's that that was the the Blaze battle was that right? Blaze was a magazine. It was a spinoff of Vibe magazine. Vibe magazine is if you don't know, it's one of the biggest print magazines for. Uh, you know, music culture and just black culture in general, um, but definitely with a, a heavy slant towards the music industry um, and, and, and then entertainment overall. Uh, so then they started Blaze magazine so they could focus on hip hop. They wanted a, something to contend with the Source magazine. Um, the Source was definitely ripe for the picking at the time. Uh, that's back when they, they was just starting to get into that little Eminem beef was just pre-brewing and, you know, whatever troubles they were getting into with, with the publisher. Um, so Blaze came and hit the scene hard with, you know, some really dope um, content, some really like great cover stories. Um, and then they did the Blaze battle. And the first battle was, and then the person who won the battle gets the back cover of the magazine. And so that's like the first time if you're an up and coming MC, you got a full page on a magazine. Like if you were doing it indie back then, you were paying about 1500 to get a full page ad. Like I remember, like we were paying money to get an ad in some. Did you hear what he just said? For a quarter page, like we was we was paying a lot of money for that. It's not oh like internet gosh. ads or running ad campaigns through, uh, you know, IG or something like that. It was, it was bread. You were paying bread to get. Well, your to stuff be out fair, there. if you want to do social media marketing right, it isn't thirty dollar ad campaigns. It's it's fifteen hundred dollar mm -hmm. ad campaigns, right? Yes. Like if you're doing it yes. correctly. So yeah, I love okay. that you're saying that too, because it does reinforce the idea that again, not a lot of this game was ever free for anybody. And it was the people who mm -hmm. were able to pull that off. Like for me, I read the Gucci main book and like one of the more profound things to me is he's describing how early, early on in his career, he runs into killer Mike and TI or T pain or something like that. And they drop prices. It was like 6,500 he pays for these features. And he's like, this is a great investment. And I'm like, yo, yeah. Everybody seems to be willing to put up money to move ahead in their career for you know, listen, you're still doing it today. To me, success is longevity. If you're able to drop like what, two or three projects, you make that whole cartoon album thing where you're drawing all this cool, colorful, amazing comic book stuff, like you're doing some incredible things with your life. And you're still doing it. That is success. So the people who put up money back in the day and put that investment into themselves are the people who today are, you know, sustainably able to do it to me that's the people that i have to learn from so that when i'm older i'm able to still create art that matters and sounds fucking whatever and like you know like it has to be like that so yo to me it's cool that you're saying that yo we were willing to put up that fifteen hundred dollars we were able to get in that magazine we were able to be a part of a part of history that you can't be a part of nah, 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 nah. I guess yeah. it's amazing that you can do that and by the way like i want to like also give flowers like that's you guys that whole that blaze thing for like my generation my era you know like i looked at it like this is this is where i want to get to this is this is what i need to strive to all, all everybody who is there that was the that was the goal that was what i'm looking at as like oh wow you know, it, there's there's a lane here. There's something that I can uh, I can figure out and try to get to, and that's you know, flowers for you know being a part of that.
being a part of, of pushing that boundary. If you didn't strive for that, I wouldn't have seen that I could strive for that, right? My man, I, I appreciate you for that. And I, I definitely appreciate the acknowledgement there. And, and, and uh, you know, uh, that's something that, you know, for, for with the Blaze battle, right? That was the jump off. That was the catalyst. That was the set off. That, that is why battle culture got to where it is as fast as it did now. And we might not be where it was now, if not for that. And so when I jumped into that second Blaze battle in 98, um, in November, it was um, a whole different group of contenders. I mean, there was some really, really dope MCs in that lineup. Uh, um, the, my first round was against Dice Raw um, from Philly. Um, Proof was in that battle right there. Um, the, the Lonnie B from the Super Friends. Um, and so the battle with me and Pumpkinhead was the one, though, where they were like, oh, there's something here. Because that was the first time they asked for a third round because they did the sound meter. And it might have, I, I wish I would have known who it went to after the second verse, but it was so close after me and PH's second round that the crowd was screaming one more round, one more round. And they saw that 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 thirst in the, in the eyes of the crowd and they were like, ching, ching. And so even though that wasn't the winning round from the battle, that was the round that they put on these promotional cassettes that they started printing up. These little styrofoam cassettes, VHS tapes. And those VHS tapes were then heavily circulated at all of the seminars after that. And that's where a lot of people got to know me was from that VHS tape. Mm. That VHS <clears throat> tape was the catalyst that got them onto HBO for their HBO battle which idea and shells were in the last round on, but I didn't wow. get into that battle because again, it was part ego, but also I felt like I was deserving. I was up in blaze. Like, yo, how can I help administrate? How can I help get behind the scenes? I want a piece of this. I want to help be a part of this. And that's when they were like, um, yeah, well, we're not going to give you anything to get involved in it if you want to get involved in it. And I'm like, but but look at what I've already done with with this so far. And they were not trying to hear anything about a partnership. And so I had nothing to do with the, the, the HBO battle. But then when they were planning the second HBO battle, they were they had me in the wings ready to battle the champion of that one. Mm. And that's when E-Dub won. Or was that the first one that E Dub won? Whichever one E Dub won, I was waiting in the wings because they wanted the last Blaze champion to battle the new one. And so I still have the Blaze Grand Champion uh, jacket because me and E Dub never got to mix it up because something happened in the venue, had to shut everything down. Um, so they gave me the, 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 the jacket signed by Russell Simmons and I had the Grand Championship for Blaze. Um, and then they moved on to other things. Um, that's but huge. From there, then other companies started picking up on what they weren't able to capitalize on with failing to launch that platform because also Blaze was on the on the precipice of closing out altogether. So soon afterwards, Blaze magazine was was gone. Okay. Um Viacom wanted to dip their toes into it. And that's where, you know, it, it, I'm sure Zoo might have shared a little bit of this story also where um, one of my boys who was in my, my original rap group, group home, my man Fula, he worked at Viacom and he was like, yo, they're trying to do something with MC battles. I know you're still on the scene. You know, can you come through with some heads, maybe show some of the producers what you guys can do? And I put out a call and I brought about 10, 15 MCs down to Viacom studio on Broadway. And we went up to the little boardroom and they, they heard a bunch of us rap and, um, you know, they picked Zoo, they picked Penn, and um, who was the third person? I think Penn had a homie mistress. They picked mistress also, um, and um, they wanted to space them out and, and give them opportunities to to, 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 to rhyme also. Um, and they were going to add it to the DFX program, and that would be the, the platform they would launch this thing. And it was like a really small segment of the program. But that's where they started with the MC battle. But it was just spit one verse, no back and forth at the time. Right. And then at a certain point, as 
these companies will do. You know, it was like, okay, Zoo's winning again. Of course, he's always winning again, right? You you want you open up a door for a real MC, like you, you're not going to bring anything up that's going to knock that out, right? Um, so they were like, "All right, we need to do something because Zoo's winning again," um, and then they, they called me in, but they they weren't interested at first, right? But they were like, "Okay, let's get an MC and MC," and I would never go at Zoo a, a, ever, right? And I would not want to, um, and I just got too much love for the brother to to, to do anything like that. So we just spit verses for for premiere we just freestyled um and um we build the way we do right um and, and then primo gave it to me that night um was that the one after where that you in your verse compliment big zoo right before big zoo comes out and does his crazy entrance heck yeah because i saw that on youtube earlier today because big zoo brought that up and told us about that on my interview with big zoo and yeah, so I was gonna say like this we is actually this watched is watched that video today. Even well, my guy, is, is... we just watched that. It's like a <clears throat> so it's really cool to hear you talk about that, but be able to like actually picture it. And shout out Big Zoo, that's some charisma, my guy. And you know the other thing too, Flex had been the the judge because he was the, the the DJ previously, right? And and Flex really really uh, connected with Zoo, and and I guess on some level with the whole. The whole aspect of the, of the MC battle being a part of that show, right? Um, and I think he was very upset that he wasn't a part of the decision. Mm -hmm. And so Flex and I had a really cold relationship on that show the entire time. There was there was barely any interaction, and he never showed me love on camera. On camera, he was always trying to, you know, uh, tell me to calm down and and uh, calling me gas. And then that just made me get more cocky and you know start talking more shit, right? Um, so it definitely, again, another political misstep of so many throughout the career but I, I i think i ended up all right so you know fuck it um but <laughs> you know so then it started confounding them as i continued to win because that's not mtv's thing they want new flavor chew it spit it out new flavor chew it spit it out um and that's that's the machine that they were building as they contributed to this culture of limited um, attention spans that we, we currently have right now, right? Ooh. So they, they started building that foundation back then. So then they were like, okay, fuck it. If we can't take them out with this one verse thing, let's make it head to head. And so then they changed the format to head to head. And I was still winning. And they were like, shit. Um, okay, let's let's not tell him who he's battling this week. And he'll find out at the show because uh, maybe that prep time is too much. And it was. You're going to give an MC eight hours and I know who I'm going to be facing off against later. A real MC, like I'm coming prepared. Even if I'm not writing it down, bars are forming throughout the day. So from rehearsal until the fucking show goes live, I got that two lines that I'm going to fit within that 30 seconds that are going to knock you out. And so that last one with the El Gant, it was a, oh, the dude can't make it over here for the for the uh the sound check we don't know what's up and me like i'm in there with the flu but i'm like i'm gonna try to do what i can do and, and try to get through it and um I, I essentially was not delivering and lyrically in the verse i gave him the the round because i did not come through with it and that's kind of mc i am wow. um and still ended up with 49 percent of the vote um so i you know i think back sometimes like i could have ended undefeated because that was going to be my last battle anyway um so then he goes on a little run afterwards and on a little tear. And then when they figured out, like, damn, we give an MC the reins and they don't let go, this isn't working for us. And then they eliminated it from the show during his run. That's um, crazy. A little while later, the so same hold on. What you're production saying is, team. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what you're saying is MTV gave people or whoever the choice, right? Like, I, I don't know who, who, was, who was the one that was choosing the winner. First, the DJ was choosing. Then, then they opened it up and, and did an online voting system. Um, so the people were and picking... And then they changed it to a head-to-head -head and online voting system. And with all of that, effectively, democracy went against MTV's wishes. So they nixed the situation rather than listening to what the people wanted because it didn't fit into what they were hoping to do with shit. Yes, what they were hoping. But they did learn from it. And that same team that oversaw the battles on dfx set up shop at 106 in park mm. 
I have a quick question. Can I pause real quick and go run to the washroom and I'll be back in two minutes? Absolutely. Awesome. Flacco usually holds it down and talks at this part. Yeah, nah, I got you. Absolutely. No, nah, but this is this is cause this is very important because you know, Breeze, like I tell people a lot, like, um when it comes to like battle rap, like there's like a pride that I feel that we have that is rightfully earned because like it's not even a pride that comes from winning these battles or um, having the gall to get into these battles, right? But, like, literally, we finally created, like, after all that work that you guys put in, what Penn, Pumpkinhead, Sarah, me, what, what Direct, and, and Grind Time, what we all set into effect essentially is a lane. We created a lane where there was no lane for us. There was no, no lane. There was no love. There was no nothing. The music industry shunned us. Nobody mm -hmm. wanted a part of us. We were the we were the 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 un the unknowns, the unloved, you know, the the cast asides. And we created a lane for ourselves and an industry for ourselves that is now feeding people. And now you got young kids who are literally earning like essentially like a, 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 a livable wage off of just battle rapping regularly, you know? And like, I'm happy for them because this is all what we, right? Like hip hop is born to spread love, spread knowledge and battling was always a part of this, you know? Like mm -hmm. you're bringing this, um, whole like pieces of knowledge from that era to it but like we know like look when djs first was dj what was they doing battling each other mm -hmm. when when b-boys start dancing what b-boys start doing battling each other mcs getting on the mic they battling each other if you doing graph what you doing you buffing somebody and you battling with your with your tags mm -hmm. this culture revolves around proving your metal and testing it against each other. And it's something that is a core part of the culture. So for years later, there to be a, a part of it that like also in the MC aspect becomes an industry within itself, like the DMC championships, which are a, a, a great, you know, it's, it's its own thing, you know, like uh, I want for eventually for us to maybe be able to have the privilege of having the Q-Berts, and those guys that like, you know, that that this is all really like important stuff that's like people aren't really informed of it, you know, and, and maybe the people that know of it, you know, they're already in the know and we need to do a better job of bridging this gap and like educating it for everyone to be able to have all of it, not just the popular people, you know. Not just the, the the cool names to say, you know, the yeah, the sure. guys like you, Zoo, Poison Pen, you know, everybody, Nunzio, everybody that helped found EO Dub, all these things mm -hmm. are very pivotal. Poison Pen, we got to get to Stronghold if we can before you leave, you know, like this is all like <clears throat> just stuff that really uh, touched a whole generation. And then guys like me got to then show the next generation and then those guys got to show the next generation and now you have the next generation of guys coming up showing the next generation of kids that are just watching them how to do it you know absolutely um uh, the, the the stronghold was the um was the was was the what where the the where i was able to say I should be in this battle for the blaze, right? Like being being a part of that crew and and where that came from, and that started with the my first um, foray into battles that I started getting known for was in '88 hip hop. '88 hip hop was part of pseudo online. Pseudo online was part of the big first internet bubble that you know burst and whatnot, where you really couldn't enjoy it unless you experienced stuff. Uh, you know, a decent bandwidth at the time, and very few people did. But for those few people who did, it was pseudo online networks. And um, they had their own production studio down in Soho, and they had all these investors, and 
it was just a crazy scene, this big warehouse space. And you'd walk in there and there was a little studio and then this big warehouse loft down on Broadway and housed in, in, the, in the village. And um, in the studio, they'd have the interview show called 88 Hip Hop. It was every Wednesday night and that was the new scene. It didn't cost anything to go up and hang out in the lounge outside. And in that lounge outside were ciphers every week. And this was back in like um, 97, I think, 97, 98. And so in those ciphers would be everyone. And I mean, everyone who was anyone who was everyone was in those ciphers. And that's where I met Poison Pen. That's where I met Life Long. That's where I met C. Rays. That's where I met uh, Stealth Index, who hosted the battle segment on the show and who bought me into the show to battle C. Ray's walls on 88 Hip Hop. And that was an off the head back and forth battle. Like they were trying to be as true hip hop as possible. They would throw on a beat, they would count bars and you would have to go back and forth. And so you could not go in there with writtens. Um, you had to come off the top. And so I was able to uh, win that round and then stay on for a, a good stretch afterwards. I did not hold Poison Penn's record for the amount of wins he had. I think Penn had like 12 wins on 88 Hip Hop. Um, he, he, he beat all sorts of people while he was on there. Like he, he's the record holder for it, for sure. Um, but I still had a, a really good run um, before wow. I got taken out uh, near the end. Um, but it was good times. It was definitely good times. But 88 Hip Hop's what gave me the cred to go into Blaze like, why am I not in this? Because everybody on the scene knew how I got down from those 88 hip hop battles. Like my word, man, you, you know, like, like, I, I don't know how much time you actually have left. So regardless of how much time you have left, it doesn't change what I'm about to say. Um, we've barely like scratched the surface of anything. I barely think we've broken into the two thousands <laughs> at this point. All right. And you've already yeah, we just, we're just starting because that then then we got to talk about the EO Dub era, um and and uh you know the so yeah Big Zoo saying we me. need a we need a breeze part two which yeah yeah is yeah something I'm, yeah I'm definitely starting absolutely. to get a little winded at this point I, I can only imagine <laughs> honestly my <laughs> guy I on, but... I live for this man this is I mean I, I take it to an excessive level so you don't I understand that it's not like everyone's cup of tea but man going four hours no no biggie for me I understand <laughs> it's not like everyone's cup of tea but yo you have blessed us so much with your life stories because yo for me it's about the knowledge nuggets right um are there is there footage of all of this period of your life we're getting a comment from ampersand who is tripping out going he's preaching the real stuff you're amazing. We're getting a lot of love for you, man, in the comment from people who are like, wow, oh, this is truly cute. fucking incredible. Like, I know sometimes when I talk to y'all, you look at your life like how you look at your life. But I do not see it at all the way that you see it. You casually name dropped so much shit that to you is insignificant. That is to me, Wikipedia fucking amazing. That like, you don't understand the perception. We're not even like we listened to your first project or whatever that i found in 2002 or whatever right we haven't even got to that and there's so many albums that came out okay you've done yeah, so many you know incredible what? I things echo, man i want to echo what holden is saying because you know what like even it again he's over there right but i'm right here you know and i was meeting you know like i had told you in, in the in the dms on instagram like I was, cause I was around, I was uh, Jean Grey and Sarah Connor, you know, lyrics like little homie. I was their yeah. little homie, you know? Yeah. And so I got to be around all you guys. And so I saw this and I'm just like, this is, the, the, but you guys got to achieve things. Bro, you got to go on Hot 97. That was, a, that's the dream when you're from New York and you rap. Know, that's the dream is to get on to Hot 97. To get to Matt, oh, be on, in like, MTV, not just the to be a part of, you know, it, you know, all these things are things that that is what showed me, you know, like this is what you do. This is this is the way that you make your journey through this, and you earn your stripes. You um uh uh maybe get to have the opportunity one day 
to uh, have a chance to entertain more than, you know, the people that, you know, that you know around your way. And yeah. without you guys doing that, you know, like there's no, so I'm looking also yeah, at you, you know, like, yo, this to, is I just incredibly like, fascinating, you know, add like. On to that a little bit, it doesn't end there too. Cause if y'all want to understand, he had dropped a project in late 2020. I don't remember exactly when. And there's this track on there. My wife caught me taking a selfie. And it goes on this like real thing where, you know, listen, I'm not like there, there, but I'm still old enough where like, I, I got a selfie stick recently and it's fucking weird to admit that I own a selfie stick. Okay. And just, and the, but you swagged it out and you went in this like deep direction with it where you were like, yeah, I'm taking a selfie. Okay. It's not really like for what you think it is. It's to do this with it. And like, you know what the truth is about the, the track is probably most of us have had that conversation with ourselves where we got caught taking that selfie and like you know it's like you have to admit to yourself a little bit you are that guy and how goofy the situation is okay that's on your latest project and they left me with this huge feeling of yo man the future's gonna be all right okay like everybody's going through this shit so for me it's like it doesn't really just end with all of your past accomplishments you made a comic book fucking music video ep album thing you're like built for the future dude but there's a key difference now than before and um uh, and that's and that's gonna be a big part of part two to the conversation because you know that there, there's there's the Dub stuff there's the the mdc stuff there's the you know there's there's a big chunk of, of homelessness and denial um, and then the well just running completely dry as far as like, you know, resources and outlets, right? Like there's, there's that piece of it. And then there's now where it's the, you know, after, after going through, you know, what I'd gone through in that, in that time frame, it's the, you know, the, 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 the rebuilding of a, of a different type of stability, you know, just, uh, stepping back from the scene and then returning to the scene at this point after having, you know, stopped to take care of business, because that's one thing that I think happened to a lot of my peers is that we got so entrenched and so focused and we leaned on so many people for so many favors and that that one more this or yo this is this one here is going to be it like it's it's going to do it for me and you know it, it, it happened for so few um that after calling in all those favors or borrowing all those borrows like you know it left a lot of people in in, in pretty dire straits so there's there's a lot of brothers out there, you know, currently in the process of rebuilding from the investment of that time and, and oftentimes resources and money. Um, but I, I definitely, you know, could have could have been a lot wiser about that earlier on, and have continued with some consistency, rather than having had to been forced to take that break. But at this point in time, I came back because of the release that I had originally found from it. And it's very different to be doing it comfortably when you don't have to, as opposed to trying to do it to get your next meal. So, and that's where the 2000s started getting really tight when it was wrapping to eat. Yeah, I can't wait to hear the rest of it for real. But I got to say that listening to you talk, hearing your wisdom, I can think of like 30 things you could do on the internet that would make serious bank you're fucking interesting you're such you're so good at this like you're teaching us like we in class but we want to come back for more that's a gift man that's all i gotta say about that that is a gift but um i get the feeling that this is a good time to like you know wrap it up and so we did have one question that was asked far before this project uh before the interview thing when we were listening to that ep that had that track with the cell phone selfie thing who produced it? We couldn't figure it out. We want to know who was the producer. That was a, a DJ Static Remix. And uh, that's a, that's another brother that we got to talk about starting off the 2000s with. And that's going to bring us to Boston also. But DJ Static, one of, one of the best that ever did it. Um, Immortal Techniques DJ on the road. Um, rocking with Penn and all of us for like mm. decades now. Um, that's a remix from uh, a, a track that I had done for for DJ Black Panther, who uh, passed away uh, not too long ago. Um, so he was the one who did the original version of the song, and then this remix um, was done by DJ Static. That's really cool. Oh, but 
Old Man Fall is the yeah. Old Man Fall is what he wanted to know. I was wrong. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. It was he part was... of the Old Man series. That was my uh, my lead up to fifty, and I wanted to uh, you know somehow all these projects got finished around the same time last year, and I was able to release fifty songs on the way to turning fifty back in December. And uh, Old Man Fall was the fourth EP that, that I released of that. And then the other two were collabos with Big Deep, um, which were, were part of the Deep Breeze project. But there was Old Man Winter, Volume 1, Volume 2, mm. um, and then Old Man Spring, and then Old Man Fall. Yeah, yeah, Old so... Man Summer would have sounded weird, so I didn't do it. Fair, but it, do you know, was it different producers for the tracks of these? Or, like, was it just... Yeah, him? Uh, Volume 1 was DJ Static produced all the tracks. Um, volume 2, Fifth Seal produced all the tracks. Vol the third one, um, uh, Old Man Spring, was by my man Chrome. He did all those tracks. And um, then for Old Man Fall, it was a mix. And that was, like, different producers that I've, I've worked with throughout the years, like, but all of these are relationships that I that I that I cherish and I, I really right. appreciate. It. So I don't I don't just do songs with people because they have a name. Right, um, right, right. It's it's oftentimes at this point in time where it's it's all about the relationships. Even what you just said is kind of what the kids are doing. So you just dropped how seventeen year olds and twenty year olds are playing the music game right now. So it's actually really cool that like you're you're playing the game the way the youth are. That's like really inspiring, isn't it? Um yeah, man. So, yo, thank I got you. hope for this wave. This wave's looking good. This wave is looking really good. I agree entirely. Yo, thank you for real for being here. It is sincerely our pleasure to learn with you. Um, you gave us a lot of your time, which is always a gift. That's how I see it. You, you taught us a lot of things. You, uh, we got to learn your history a little bit, a good foundation for when we get into the next parts of your journey. Um, and uh, with that, I just got to say, like, it's so cool. Like that that's the best way I can put it. This was a very cool one for me. I feel like your energy is really amazing and you're just so sincere with it that like it's delightful to talk to you. That that's honestly how I feel with it. Um yeah, I don't know if you have any last words, Flacco, if you have any last words. I just wanted to say thank you again for real. Much appreciated. Thank you for everything you did. Thank you for everything you continue to do. Right, because that's that's the path that we all follow behind. Like, I'm the next gen, so it's just like I look at it like, "Yo, this is me," you know. Like, because I'm not gonna stop like making music ever, you know. Like, that's not. Yeah. It's just if you you know when you're when you do this, this is how it is for us, and it's yeah. just like a forever yeah. thing. And it's just like so. Thank you very much, and thank you for coming on. And yeah, please, like, let's uh, have you back on for a part two if we can. Yeah, I'll be more than happy to come back through, man. Like I said, that I, 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 this was very therapeutic for me as well. Um, it, it, it helps to to reflect, and then this was a great time of reflection. I appreciate y'all for uh, having the the curiosity and and for uh, you know digging this deep because I am in a quiet taste for most. Um, and uh, although I'm connected in, in so many interesting ways to so many different personalities, like uh, it, it's definitely one of those uh, stories you got to dig to find. So I appreciate y'all being curious enough. No, that's to Flacco. Get to this part. Flacco is it's straight up. up. The, I'll be, I am curious just to hear your story, but we got to give Flacco his flowers here. He was like, nah, you got to do it. And then Big Zoo also made you sound super interesting. And I'm like, I don't know who Breeze ever flowing is, and they're like, "Well, I know we can we can write yeah, nah, the situation." <laughs> yeah, poison pen, and that's just been my because my thing is just not let's choose do everything natural, right? And Holden is like a great interviewer, and he also is he wants to know, he wants this knowledge, and it's just like to me, it's like let's just keep on connecting dots, right? Mm. So like if. We're interviewing Zoo and we're interviewing Penn and they both mention Breeze. It's just like, well, the logical uh, step to me is like we should have Breeze on yeah. so that Breeze can talk yeah, about yeah. and because well, it fills out the picture. But it's you know? also like everybody's looking, everybody's looking from each of our perspectives, right? So yeah. it's a different uh, 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 portrait that we paint, but it's all a part of 
like the bigger yes. canvas but that we're really all is. painting together in the culture, you know? Yeah. And it's just one big old graffiti wall. It's one big old, you know, uh, the, the Harlem picture, you know, like of, of like the jazz renaissance era, but like, remember when they did it again? Um, the double yes. XL, you know, yes. it's, it's just that. Yes. It's, and each of us gets to like, look at, you know, what we put up there, but when we put our stories together, it makes the picture a little bit more clearer to see. And on yeah, top man. of that, just to kind of shift it to the audience watching, because we always have to thank the audience who's watching this live yeah, yeah. on various platforms. Yo, at least on my chat, there are people coming back like week over week. So they watched Poison Pen mention your name and they actually watched Big Zoo mention your name. So in a sense, like you're 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 giving people who really don't know any of this a real window and i can't pretend like it's a crazy number of people but i'm the kind of person that's like yo one person's an amazing number of people in a sincere way but the fact that there are people who are able to stack this knowledge along with us and every everywhere it's streaming a couple more people are going to collect over time it's like you're helping us achieve this bigger goal of showing the world what really happened and that's how i look at yeah, it no. Also over here, because I have, I always do the watch party on my Facebook and like people are in and out the whole time, you know, like the homies are all like, uh, very like complimentary of like everything, like, and just, Oh, I remember that. And you know, so yeah, yeah it was like no. even people watching somebody shared it on my Facebook said solid interview, tagged me with it. And that's not like really me as much as it's you being quite interesting sharing real knowledge i can only work with what's available in front of me my guy that's the truth of the situation <laughs> but uh thank you all for watching on all the various platforms yeah. you are watching because without all you i mean like it's fun but i can tell you when nobody's watching it's not as fun so it's much more fun because y'all are watching and showing us that you're also interested making us feel like this is interesting and letting us go extra hard with it and it makes it a beautiful experience so without y'all being here I don't know. It wouldn't be as dope. That's all I can say. So thank y'all now watching it. Thank y'all watching it in the future. Make sure that you hit up the end of the week. Uh, EOWTV on all the different platforms and follow, subscribe. If you're watching me, you know, same kind of shit. Follow, subscribe, all that good stuff. Um, if it's in the future, same kind of thing. Make sure that you show love to the people that are, are you know, doing all this. Also make sure that you follow breeze ever flow and at least in all the stuff we put out we're gonna make sure that your links in description are all down there all the, the instagram and all the good stuffs that we could find about you the youtube stuff because yo it's important to go follow it like let's get breeze ever flow into like ten thousand fucking subscriber type shit let's elevate these people yeah that's within our power yeah. people of the internet yeah. and the geeky sides we can do yeah. that Maybe not today. Be the now. change you want to see in the world is what we always, time. you know, like <laughs> be the change and and support. Uh, it don't it don't cost nothing, right? To hit the subscribe, exactly. And to hit it, watch when you watch. To hit the like button on the video, uh, leave a comment. That doesn't cost you anything, and all that it does is help the traffic for your videos and what you're doing. And, and if you so, like one of those people that's all like, yo, real hip hop don't exist in 2020 bullshit. Breeze ever flow and drop projects. That's what I'm trying to say. Everybody of every sounds dropping projects of every era. Just let's get the love out. Let's stop with the hate and get the love out. You know what I'm saying? See, now I'm saying that shit all the time. So you know what I'm saying? It's fucking like I just don't <laughs> it from y'all. <laughs> We've infected you. That's we exactly got you. By happened. the way, Breeze didn't say no I'm saying like at all. Nah, because he's like <laughs> top tier with this shit. Yeah, he no. get he, it. He, my, my man definitely is not like a, a beholden to the New York. Like, I don't know where it happened to me. I used to be so eloquent. I don't know what happened in the last few years. It's amazing though. <laughs> but thank you for being here again. So, I mean, I'm going to, I feel like we can get to the part where I guess we can say, you know, live long, prosper, everybody. If you have any super final words, this would be the greatest time to put them. Fucking love it. That's perfect.